it's a little late, but. Um, okay. Cool. Jack? Yes. Amherst Media is here. So, and you have all of your members. A couple aren't viewable, but they are all here. Okay. So you are good to go. Very good. Uh, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of July 28th, 2021. My name is Jack Jumpslick, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and it's available via Amherst Media Livestream. Minutes are being taken pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. This Planning Board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by following a link shown on the slide. This link is also available on the meeting agenda posted on the town's website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No one in-person attendance of the public will be permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship and despite best efforts, we will post on the Town of Amherst website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. For members, I will take a roll call. I'm going to call your name and mute yourself, answer firmly, and then place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. Doug Marshall. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Present, and I'll be on video shortly. Great. And then myself as well. So, Jack Jones, like, so uh, board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. Discussion may be suspended while the issues are addressed, and the minutes will note if this happens. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raise hand and call you on, call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and is reserved for comments regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Public comment may also be heard at uh, other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. Please indicate if you wish to make a comment during the public comment period by clicking the raise hand button. Um, if you have joined the Zoom meeting, use using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address. Put yourself back in a mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. So, um, as we begin, our first item is minutes, and we don't have any to review um, today. And we can open it up to uh, public comment. And I'm uh, just looking uh, at that screen now. Yes. Jack, I want to tell you I, had, you, I had a problem with the timer today, and I accidentally deleted it out of my computer. And so we don't have the three minute timer. Oh, yeah, that was a nice addition. So, I know, I'll get it back. I mean, I, I have yeah. reached out, but um, I haven't made a good connection yet. Okay, I'll try to keep an eye on it. Yeah, I'm sorry. And um, so um, are there any, um, anyone in the public that wanna utilize the public comment period? All right, I see no hands, so we can jump into the agenda. And we are going to bring up old business as a first item, as a matter of convenience. Um, and that would be SPR 2020-05-462 Main LLC, John Robaleski, 462 Main Street. And a request approval of minimal but not substantial changes to the site plan under condition number eight of the decision for the site plan review SPR 2020-05. So I believe we would have a presentation by... John is here and Christine Royal, his um, consultant is also here and I think they've both been moved into being 
panelists. Oh, Christine. Yeah, Christine is going to make the presentation. I see her hand raised. Okay, I, I didn't know that she was with them. So I'm moving. I just moved her. Sorry. Sorry, Christine. My apologies. So hello, John. You, um, and then Christine, we see you. Good evening. And you're unmuted. Great. Are you going to lead the presentation, Christine? Um, I will share screen as needed, um, but I think John might have some things he'd like to start with. OK. Hi, John. How are you? We hear you. OK. So the project has taken a couple of turns. Um, so right now, you know, our goal is to get a CO because we have tenants moving in in about two weeks. Um, so we're just trying to deal with the trash and recycling area and get that approved. Um, ideally, I mean, what we're asking for tonight that was presented is to, instead of re, you know, tearing down and rebuilding the back 14 by 14 foot area of the existing building, um, and rebuild that as we had approval for on the original plans. One of two things, I mean, right now we're asking for if we can maintain that area for the interim anyway, until we get permission probably on August 18th uh, from the board to completely remove the building as an alternate, as an amendment to the site plan. Um, and also to change the rear door there, which is currently about 32 inches wide put the three foot wide door in there so trash cans could go in and out and bicycles and so forth and use that area back there that's about the same size as the proposed uh, rebuild. So we figure it's there. Uh, eventually, we're gonna have a temporary shed request there. The ideal situation is if the board would consider tonight to allow us to remove that 14 by 14 foot area and place the shed there now. Nothing's really going to change. Um, that would still give us space to remove the rest of the building. And it would end up in the same place in about a month from now anyway. But if the board's not, you know, attuned to uh, considering that, then what you had before you here is what we uh, are presenting. So basically it's, you can see the approved addition on the back there, we were gonna enlarge it a little bit to the east and move the door. Uh, right now we're moving the door around to the north side where the existing door to get into that portion of the building is now. Another consideration, this plan shows that uh, we put a roof over there because we thought it'd be a little more uh, the same as what was approved on the original plan. We look at it now, the contractor says, well, why would you bother putting a roof over that small area uh, just to cover a couple of bicycles or something in the interim and have that whole thing disappear in a month or six weeks or whatever. So I guess if we can put that door in and have that accessible, I mean, a ramp going up to it and so forth, uh, to the finished floor is going to be about the same as what's on the uh, grading plan that has been approved. So a couple of things, if you would consider not putting a roof over that back area there, because we'd have to build that actually and extend it and put in some posts, that would disappear potentially in you know five or six weeks. Or to allow us to completely remove that back 14 by 14 foot area and place the shed there before tenants move in the middle of August and have it there once we demo the rest of the building. Um, so that's pretty much it in a nutshell, other than some more items regarding uh, some landscaping changes and stuff. And originally we are hoping to save, there was three Hinoki Cypress plants to the right of the driveway when you drove into the uh, uh, parking area before we did anything. We tried to dig those out and transplant them and the landscapers said, you know what, just the root structure just isn't there and they're not gonna survive. So 
he actually took them to his house and one survived. So that's a change um, as far as what's in the front of the transformer. Um, other than that, if we can just put some arbor body there that we can keep trim to a height high enough to uh, screen the transformer and then put in the inkberry bushes as is on the landscaping plan that's been approved to screen the uh, front three parking spaces there. That's pretty much as far as landscaping. Uh, other than the narrow area that's between the sidewalk and the building itself. So in the, the north section of the parking area right in front of the building on the west side, uh, my wife is concerned about putting some of those bushes in there that would end up growing too big. So she's talked with a landscaper if we can get permission just to substitute something of similar size that's not going to grow as big that will stay more compact because there's windows right there for some of the dwelling units and it's only a matter of about three and a half to four feet planting area between the sidewalk and the building. Uh, electrical vehicle charging ports initially they were shown on a plan to be in front of the transformer and end up being a kind of a cramped area there and um, Eversource suggested putting them on the other side of the parking lot just directly across from there. Uh, so that's where they ended up. And on the original plans I don't think we showed the solar panels on the west side of the building so there's going to be 95 solar panels, the majority of which will be on the east roof line, but we do want some facing on the west so to get take advantage of that uh, late day sun. So you will see some solar panels and I think it's, you know, good. Good for everybody to see that also. So it'd be about, I think, 28 or 30 panels uh, facing west. So John, I, I see that Chris has her hand up and then I, I feel like we need some uh, plans to point out some of these changes that you're referring to just so we can get a better perspective. Yeah. Um, Christine, well, do you have that? I, I do have it up. I am sharing my oh, screen. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris Brestrup. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Chris Brestrup yeah. has her hand up. So, oh, and okay. then and then you guys. I wanted to give the big picture here. Um, John is asking for approval for very small things right now tonight. Essentially, he's asking for approval to not build the new shed on the back of the house and instead use the old shed to store trash and um, bicycles and mail, I believe. And um, he was suggesting that he would put a roof over the area where the bicycles would be and that he was gonna put in a new door. So that's really all he's asking for tonight. Meanwhile, he has run into trouble with the house and he's been before the historical commission and they've given him permission to take down the house but he needs to go through a site plan review application process to take down the house. And then he has some other changes that he wants to make like moving the electrical um, charging stations and uh, changes in planting and other things. So right now tonight, all he's asking for is what's in this image here. He wants to um, do the image on the right where it says proposed addition. Um, there's a floor plan for that, and there's an, an image of it um, instead of the approved addition. And this is because in the long run, which is probably going to be sometime in the next few months, he wants to take down the house and put in a storage shed for bicycles and trash. And this would be a temporary storage shed because um, he's just purchased the property next door at 446 Main Street. So um, he wants to figure out, you know, a connection to the property next door and what he should do with the property next door. And so there are some long-term plans that need to be laid, but he, he wants to make the property um, livable and, you know, nice and neat for the tenants of the new building. But he has run into trouble with this existing house and he's got to take it down. But as I said, that's an application that has just been submitted and it's going to be advertised next week. And there's a public hearing for it on the 18th of August. But tonight you're just being asked to 
approve this change in the back shed from a new shed to alterations on the old shed, which include adding um, the covering and changing the door. And now Mr. Robleski has said tonight that he would prefer not to add the covering. So it sounds like he's just wanting to um, put in a new door and leave everything as it is. That's my understanding of the situation. So, so it's pretty simple for tonight, but it's gonna get more complicated next on the 18th. August, August. August 18th, okay. So uh, John, you mentioned tearing down that portion of the building, but is that even in the cards? Well, it's possible, you know, construction wise, it's, it was attached to the main frame of the building years ago and it's not on a foundation. So the foundation of the rest of the building is entirely separate. If you remember, there is no foundation under this back section and just on bricks and stones. Mm -hmm. um, so it's easy enough to disconnect that, you know, just cut it off from the existing building, basically the three walls and the main wall that attaches to the house would still be there. It's just saving time and redoing things type thing. That's the only reason I ask. Yeah, yeah. so uh, Chris, can, can you speak to that, Chris? Yeah, um, so what Mr. Robleski wants to do is um, take down the shed and put in, um, or take down the back area and put in a shed. But you haven't seen pictures of the shed yet. Um, it is coming on August 18th, and I think you should really wait until August 18th when you've got the whole proposal before you for that. And okay. we have four other. That's, that's fine. Tonight, that's fine. And we, fit, we fit this in, you know, thinking that it would take um, 15 or 20 minutes. If we get too complicated about it, it's going to be. Yeah. Problem, so. Yes. So, John, we, we have a we do yeah. have a full night. So maybe if we can just focus on exactly what you need to do at a minimum. Yeah, and, that's, and, and, that's fine. I, I okay. understand. Yep. OK. So that includes um, adding the shed roof, maybe, maybe not, and and putting in a new door in this existing shed and then just using it. And the plan for that is shown in the lower right-hand corner of the drawing that Christine Royal is showing. Yeah, so let me just walk through this very quickly. This is the existing condition now, and this is the existing uh, back shed area that we're talking about. And although there's a trailer in this photo, yeah. you can see here is the door. And we'd really like to keep the door as we're showing in this new proposed addition in the same location. So we're, we're proposing minimal to no change um, to this back addition, aside from the fact that the door needs to be wider for accessibility. Um, so this center column was what was originally approved way back. And you can see that we're really trying to do de minimis change so that this can be approved and move forward. Um, and as John noted, um, you know, everything will get a little more complicated at the next meeting, um, but it's really keeping the uh, existing building as is, widening the door and improving access to the back. Um, John did mention, and um, it's true that this roof shed over the bikes is not obviously not existing. And if we don't need it, to really comply with um, the de minimis change, we'd like to not add it as just as just added costs that will um, be removed in six weeks or so time after our next meeting. Thank you. So I think are you you pretty much have uh, all set because I know you come back August eighteenth. You're going to have a lot more detail, uh, mm -hmm. but now we just focus on the shed. So if you're done with your presentation, I can solicit the planning board comments. Yep, all set, thank you. Okay, all right. So uh, Doug and then Andrew. Yeah, I wondered whether we can approve this uh, for a, a particular short duration on the condition that the applicant return within a reasonable period of time with the, the rest of the picture. Because, you know, if we can give him, you know, sort of a temporary approval, 
and that that would simplify things in my mind. Maybe Chris can tell us that. Yeah, Chris. So, so this kind of thing doesn't usually allow um, conditioning because it's not a real application. And Mr. Robleski has submitted his application to do this more complicated version. He submitted the fee and the application form and all the drawings that go along with it. So I think he's really serious about pursuing this. So I think it's um, probably not necessary to try to condition this, um, especially because you can't really condition this type of thing. And oh, by the way, Rob Mora is here in the wings if things get really complicated. Good to know. Uh, Andrew and then Janet. I, I'm ready to make a motion, but if Janet's got some questions, I'd, I'd let her ask her questions first. Yeah, I mean, you, you can make a motion and then we can have discussion afterward. It doesn't. Um... Fair enough. So I'll, I'll make a motion that we approve this with uh, without the shed uh, extension that, that is being proposed. For the roof, okay. Yep. Um, any second to that? Second. Okay, Doug. Uh, okay, so now we have uh, additional discussion. Uh, we have Janet. Um, I thought I understood what was going on until um, you said there's going to be more drawings later on the 18th. So on the 18th, there's going to be, a, and we're going to look at the proposal to demolish the building and build a new one. Like, are, what drawings could there be? Like, I don't, I don't really understand where we are, like, in the process in terms of applications and things then. Uh, Chris Bressrup has her hand up. So um, Mr. Robleski has this new building and he needs to get tenants into it in the middle of August, August 15th, I think. So he's taking a very um, stopgap short um, path tonight and hoping to get approval from you to do minimum changes to that back area. Mm -hmm. And then he has filed a new application um, to change, to amend the previous site plan review application um, decision. And he's going to take down, he hopes to be able to take down the existing house. And he's going to add a very small shed. It's only, I think, 12 by 16. It's like the kind of shed that you see, you know, in uh, gardening stores. And um, it's not going to have a foundation, and that's going to be a temporary measure. Um, and he will come back sometime in the future future with a more detailed plan. And that future future probably won't happen for six months or six to nine months or maybe even a year. But tonight, he's just asking to make those small changes to that shed that already exists on the 18th. He's going to come with a full application to take down the house, um, put up a new small shed, and do those other things that he talked about, change the location of the EV um, charging stations, make the changes to the planting. I think he's going to add a small one small parking space that would accommodate an Uber or a Lyft. He's calling it shared parking. And there may be some other small things, but anyway, that's coming to you as a full-blown site plan review application on the 18th. But tonight, he's just asking for that small change to the back um, so that he can leave the house in place because he doesn't have approval from you to take down the house yet. And we know that that's going to be a complicated conversation and people are going to want to weigh in on it. The public will. So um, we think that that's best handled at a public hearing that's devoted to that particular topic. And tonight we're just asking for the one small um, change. So Chris, we're just to ignore what was in our packet with regard to the the demo and, and the house information, which seemed very informative, by the way, uh, with his with the structural engineer. But we'll just ignore that. Uh, well, ignore it gives you context for yeah. why he's doing this small stopgap measure. Okay, he has this other larger hurdle to overcome, which is to get permission from you all to take down the house. He doesn't have that permission yet, so I thought I would send that information along so you could have 
that as a background. But he's okay. not proposing to do that tonight. He's just proposing to change the door on the shed. All right. Any other further discussion amongst the board? I see none. Uh, um, let's open it up to the to the public. Any public comment on this? I don't see any. Okay, so uh, we can do a roll call. And uh, Maria approve. And Andrew. Hi. Doug. Hi. Tom? Aye. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And I will be an aye as well. So it's seven zero. So thanks, John. Thank you, Christine. All right, so um, with that, we can get back into our public hearing. And so, uh, Yeah, we have uh, we have what? Uh, Jack, three. I'm, I'm, I'm doing some clicking over here. We have we have to bring people in, right? Kyle and right, right. So I was just making sure. Well, you're doing that. I'll just go through all these things. So we're okay. gonna uh, open up the hearing again for. Um, Again, it's a combination of site plan review and special permits, but um, SPP 2021-03, Archipelago Investments. And all of these will be Archipelago Investments, LLC. So this uh, first one is 1111, uh, 1113 East Pleasant Street for non-conforming building to be structurally altered, enlarged, or reconstructed under section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw for a mixed use building proposed under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw. Uh, the, the, uh, the next one is SPR 2021-07 and SPP 2021-02. And this is um, uh, the hearing to request a site plan review. Uh, again, it's a continuation approved for construction of a mixed use building containing dwelling units in combination with ground floor retail commercial, including uh, approximately 1,300 square feet of retail space. I'm not sure that's right, but um, uh, I, lobby. Um, Jack, may I interrupt just to comment? Yes, yeah. So um, Archipelago came in um, earlier this year and applied for a building that conformed to the what you're describing right now. Yes. They have not withdrawn that application yet. They may ask to withdraw it tonight, but we don't know that. So we're leaving it on the agenda because the public hearing for that hasn't been closed and the planning board hasn't made any decisions about that. But that was for the building that was um, 55 units and 1300 square feet of retail. And it also included okay. parking. The initial proposal. Okay, it's yeah, it can be confusing. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that has uh, 1,300 square feet of retail space, lobby, leasing, fitness, trash area, mechanical space, elevator, parking, and 55 apartments under section 3.325 uh, of the zoning bylaw, and to request a special permit to modify dimensional requirements for height, uh, side, and rear setback under footnote A of table three, section six of the zoning bylaw. So, and then the next one is SPR 2021-09, and again, this is a continuation. Uh, again, we, we met May 5th, June 2nd, and June 30th on this. So this is a request of site plan review approval under section 5.00 of the zoning bylaw for an accessory and incidental use to permitted principal use on an adjacent lot for construction, staging, and management of the 11 East Pleasant Street project. Post-construction site will be stabilized with asphalt service and fence. And the last one is SPR 2021-12 at 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street, public hearing for the, uh, this is a continuation from June 30th uh, only, uh, the public hearing for a site plan review application for construction of a mixed use building containing dwelling units in combination with ground floor retail commercial, including 2,200 square feet of retail space, lobby, 
leasing uh, fitness, trash area, mechanical space, elevator, and 90 apartments, including 11 portable units under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw. So that's all that kind of bundled together. Um, so we can ask the uh, project proponents uh, to have their presentation. And we have Kyle, Dave, looks like Mark Bobrowski. How are you doing, Kyle? Hello, Dave. And, Good evening. Okay. So Kyle, I'll just, I'll just hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, we, since we last saw you, we have met on site and we've been before the DRB. Um, I believe you have in the packet everything we've uh, shown the DRB. I think we wanted to keep our presentation pretty short tonight and, and basically do what we can to respond to questions. Um, uh, I believe that uh, Chris and Pam have all, everything we've submitted. Do you want me to, what's the best way for me to, uh, to do this? Should I share a screen or? Um, what, what I have available is what was in the packet. Um, well, I'll, I'll share the screen and I'll show you what we've submitted and I'll, okay. I'll go through that and that's the best way. Let me get you guys on here. Okay. I'm coming. Sorry, guys. No problem. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. So um, I'll start with the architectural. I'll try not to rename it. Uh, this is in your packet. So this is uh, updated and presented to the design review board. The intent of this was to show the improvements to the streetscape and the um, uh, town right of way. So you'll see that on the site plan here. Um, uh, the, the three trees out front, the crosswalk, the benches, the bollards, the bike loops, the tree grates and the tree guards. Um, you will see the uh, ground floor plan, which I'll try to remove this, uh, shows the entirety of the ground floor, um, uh, which has not changed since we last submitted. Um, and then the upper four plans remain as they are. Uh, the rendered elevations that show the street facing uh, facade has remained the same. Uh, the north side has remained. Uh, the uh, east side facing West Cemetery and the south side facing One East Pleasant have remained. And we've updated the rendering. So this rendering shows uh, the proposed improvements uh, in the town right of way uh, from the property line to the curb. The curb lines remain the same uh, to accommodate for the bus on the north end uh, to accommodate for the new crosswalk uh, that would um, uh, cross Pleasant Street there. Uh, there are three trees that are planted in there. Uh, as per conversations with Alan Snow, those are trees, uh, species of his choosing uh, that we would install. There's pavers that come across the street, across from the site, across the sidewalk to uh, the right of way. Uh, the bench that, uh, Pacifica bench that we installed at One East Pleasant is proposed here and the tree grates, uh, the tree guards and the uh, granite bollards. All of those are from the uh, town uh, standards uh, that are used elsewhere in town. Um, additional rendering show some of that in context, show the tree in front. Uh, these are very similar. Um, and we did show and discuss the, you know, the corrugated metal roof screen, you know, um, for that materiality for the roof screen above. Um, the landscape, revised landscape also shows those streetscape improvements. So this L1 plan remains similar to what we've previously shown, all planted, pulled back from the cemetery with the trees uh, running across. And then the streetscape improvements are L2.0, which is again, showing um, those same improvements, noting that all, calling out the granite bollard, calling out the pavers, the bench, the bike loops, the tree grate, we're proposing round rather than square to accommodate the geometries and the tree guards, also the, um, uh, the bike loops. Um, 
we have pro shown three. Uh, we also have the photometric plan um, that is, um, you know, basically showing the photomet. You know, our lighting has been proposed has been centered around egress and getting in and out of the site. Um, everything's downcast. Everything is shielded. Uh, we have projects north of this and south of this, um, and the lighting approach is very is effectively identical. Um, we have three renderings. Um, the first is from the north of the bike share. So that is um, from coming south on Pleasant Street. You can see Spoke in the foreground, People's Bank in the foreground, and one is Pleasant uh, to the south. Uh, and the bike share and the streetscape improvements and the new sidewalk on Kendrick Park, um, the street lights. Um, and you can see the ground floor. You can see the, uh, the gash, as we've called it here on the north side. Um, and you can see it relative to one East Pleasant. Um, uh, you can also uh, look at another rendering here, which is of uh, the dentist parking lot, as I've called it. So um, I stepped back. We looked at some uh, potential renderings further east as you're coming from the high school heading towards uh, the roundabout. And um, obviously there's a bunch of trees along there that prevent a streetscape view from working out well. But uh, stepping back here, we were able to uh, show the, a bit of the facade here, uh, that, that stretch that runs um, out to Pleasant Street. And then there's, there's two trees that are existing here, three trees that are gonna remain here on the north of 11 East Pleasant property. And there's actually two trees that are going to remain here. We wanted to kind of stem that a little bit so you could see the, the, the edge of that uh, facade. And I'll show you those two trees in a subsequent rendering, which is here from West Cemetery, which was requested and we just submitted today. Um, so the two trees that we just had a site visit um, yesterday morning at 9 a.m. At that site visit, we walked around to the cemetery side. We looked at the two trees that are on the town side, those on the town side of the fence, which will remain. These two trees and another to the north um, are north of the property, they'll remain. And these are our uh, proposed plantings in between the building and the property line um, uh, represented here by uh, the fence. Um, and I think that that is it. Uh, civil, um, I don't think, I think is repeating everything that we've discussed previously. So I think with that, um, we would, uh, we would open it up to questions. Okay. Um, well, you, you do, you want to do the right away a little bit? Um, sure. Yep. We, and I, yeah. yep. I'll go through that a little bit more. I think that that's, I will try to stop flipping this so much, but so the right of way improvements are listed here. Uh, again, the, the, the location of the curb doesn't change, accommodates the bus. We obviously close off the existing curb cut that serves the parking lot that we're redeveloping. Um, the the genus pavers that we're using on uh, the, the private property would come over the, the walkway that's six feet, the, the paved concrete sidewalk per town standards at six feet. Uh, there'd be pavers on the street side of that. There's two Pacifica benches shown. There's three tree grates and trees and tree guards. And then there is a bike uh, loop here, a bike loop here, and a bike loop here. There's also a uh, bollard shown uh, facing the street. All of these, as we've said in previous meetings, uh, we, we realize need to go through multiple layers of approval. Uh, we are willing to pay for these improvements. We wanted to show what we thought was the best solution to those improvements. And we understand that, you know, subsequent boards may have to tweak things, change things or, or push, but we wanted to uh, show you what we are proposing. That's shown here in the rendering, gives a little more dimension to it. So again, you can see that the curb line remains in the same location. We close off the curb cut to the parking that's here. That becomes a crosswalk, three trees, um, uh, the benches and the bollards. Thank you, Kyle. Um, Tom, would you mind going over the DRB findings? 
Sure, Jack. Give me one second. Let me get my file here in front of me. Um, so um, I guess to summarize, I think um, the DRB was um, had unanimously unanimously voted to approve the project. Um, there was a lengthy debate. There was a lot of public comment, um, and I think there were there. Were, uh, large collection of very positive comments, especially feedback about the improvements to the streetscape, um, which you see in this rendering here, which came up many times. Um, but the, um, the motion that was approved um, was basically to allow the project to go forward with a set of uh, what we call recommendations or suggestions. And um, um, Essentially, the, the, the key elements that we that were up for discussion, um, the top of the list um, really focused on the rear setback um, from uh, there were many people on the board or a few people on the board, which is not that many people, a few people on the board that um, <laughs> were really um, concerned about the rear setback. So that would be the um, the east facade. Am I correct? Um, Yep. And um, again, from a visual perspective from the, um, um, the cemetery, people really wanted to see that setback um, increase to the full 20 um, if possible. Um, but again, approved as is, again, just expressing their concerns about that rear facade. Um, and we do um, understand that there will be a discussion about which side will have the trees, who will plant the trees, and exactly what that tree configuration will be at a later date. So Kyle might be able to verify that um, after the fact. Um, and I think from there, there were some comments about, um, as you can see in the packet, um, window shades came up, um, making sure that those are clean. There's lots of windows here. So there will be a figure in the foreground of the building from a design perspective. Uh, making sure that those are rigid and not curtains. Um, so some form of um, um, shades were uh, preferred. Um, there was concern about the rendering showing the trees in front, as Kyle mentioned. Um, those will be um, managed or decided upon uh, with cons consultation from the tree warden, but we felt like trees with more of a canopy here would be better than the ones that are shown in this particular rendering. Um, so and we'll let them make that decision. Um, there was a little bit of concern about maintenance. So making sure that things like the boulder in the courtyard um, and the material, uh, the wood material stays maintained um, for appearances. And we know that Kyle has experience with this from other projects, um, but that was a concern that wood would degrade over time. And I think even Doug raised that um, some time ago um, and um, we address that there. Um, and then I think the, the, you know, the last issue that keeps coming up is, is really trying to think about that, um, that north facade that people did feel like it is um, beautiful, yet um, an expansive surface that they would like to see broken up in some other way, um, whether materially or um, um, spatially if possible. But again, these are suggestions. Um, we do hope that Kyle would um, take those into consideration. Um, and the last thing was a photometric plan, which we just never saw. And we saw that in this review. But, um, but that's the sort of the overarching um, issues that we were debating. But it was, it was, there was quite a bit of feedback from the public, um, much of which we'll probably hear again tonight. Um, so um, both um, some in favor, but mostly, you know, with similar concerns, so. Okay, before we uh, open it up to the board, Chris, do you want to speak to any of this new information? Uh, the photogrammic, uh, I say that right, <laughs> um, plan for the light levels, they look good, but, and then any other comments you have um, based on the new information that, that we just, you know, gotten in the last couple of days? Um, I would say that the um, design of the, of the right-of-way um, is, you know, flexible, although uh, I think what is being shown here is, you know, it represents the different components that um, the applicant is agreeable to providing. 
Um, so those components could be moved around um, based on meetings with the town council or whoever else has to approve this, um, including the planning board. The planning board can make uh, <coughs> on it. Um, and I don't know if it's been brought to the DPW yet. I think it probably hasn't. Um, so one thing that the staff thought was that by providing this um, improved right of way here, that it tended to um, create a larger area in the front of the building. Um, you know, that it added to the triangular space that's immediately in front of the building and made that a more usable space. Um, let's see what else. Um, in terms of the photometric plan, I took a quick look at it. What they're doing is lighting the walkways that lead alongside their building. Um, there's not a lot of light underneath that overhanging area, as far as I can tell, but the um, the walkways are what they're focusing on lighting so that they get their people back from the streetscape back to the entryway into the building. And there's an entry on the north side and the south side. Um, I don't think I have any other comments right now. Certainly I'll have comments okay. when get into the conditions and right. findings if you get that far. Yes, yeah. Um, I just wanted to check in with you. Uh, so. Mm, planning board members looking for hands. Okay, so we have Janet and then Doug. Janet? I just wanted to supplement Tom's comments that um, one of the recommendations was to consider for the design review board was to consider expanding the size of the proposed on site outdoor plaza in front of the building facing East Pleasant Street. And so I know, so that's clear. And then some, some of the members were commenting that the small side plaza, um, which has the granite boulder or just a boulder was too small. And so there was some talk, someone, some members mentioned combining that space or just making it bigger for everyone to share. I hope I'm not talking out of turn, but I did see that recommendation number seven. Okay, the, the granite boulder item, it, can we get a, a graphic on that? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Janet, anything else? I have other things, but I just wanted to add that while we were talking. Okay. All right. Uh, Doug, please. Okay. Yeah, I had several questions and I guess I'll just sort of throw them all out and see how many people can answer. Um, first of all, I wondered whether you, Jack, or Chris could help us structure this conversation. You know, we have, it looks like we have two special permits and two site plan reviews to work our way through here. And I'm wondering whether we could sort of deal with the issues in the first site plan review and then deal with the issues in the second site plan review, all for whichever of these submittals Archipelago wants us to consider first, since we have two different buildings that have been submitted. Um, I would be more comfortable if we just sort of structured it in a way that, that I was clear about exactly what we were talking about while we did it. So that's my first request. Um, okay, Chris has her hand up, let's see. So Great you thoughts. have two site plan reviews and two special permits to deal with. Um, there's also the sort of vestigial site plan review application. And um, this may be an appropriate time to ask um, the applicant what his thoughts are about that application and whether he might um, choose to withdraw it or what his intention is with re regard to that. My impression is that um, the applicant is not focused on that um, application at this time and that he's putting his energy into what you're seeing on your screen here. And so um, my advice would be not to spend a lot of time on that previous site plan review application, particularly since it doesn't meet the uh, inclusionary zoning requirements. And, and I would say, I would agree that with that with Chris. Um, the intent is to um, proceed with this the site plan uh, review that we have before you and the previously submitted we've held um, 
um, to be withdrawn uh, subsequent to that. Okay. Okay, great. Then, um, so for this particular design, I guess I'm wondering, the, the more I look at this and the more I think about it, um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering a little bit more about whether uh, I actually would, whether it would be smart on our part to ask for some sort of setback on the west end, on the street frontage end. Um, you know, I'm, I'm less concerned about whether the people in the cemetery are uh, seeing the building 10 feet closer. Um, and I guess I'm just, I'm just thinking uh, we might, particularly if that retail space could potentially ever be a restaurant or something that, you know, how everybody spilled out onto the sidewalk during the pandemic. Um, you know, so, so anyway, I'm wondering whether we might, it might be smart for us to set maybe a, a setback of say 10 feet from the property line as the setback for the entire building. And then I'm also interested to know from the applicant um, what the overall width of the building is uh, on its narrow dimension and what the impact would be of, of requiring the north side to meet the bylaw of 10 feet setback rather than the five feet that's been proposed. So I, I'm, I'm interested in, a, in, in responses from my committee members or my board colleagues to the to the question about whether a, a setback on the street side would be supported. And I'm interested in hearing from Kyle on the north side impacts. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Kyle, do you have any? Yeah, I would I'd say relative to the, the side yard setback. Um, we need to be clear that the bylaw states that no set side yard setback is required. If required, it's 10 feet, right? So the reason for that is so you have access. We have an easement to the north of this property, right? So the building is 60 feet wide and that allows you to have a double loaded corridor and efficiently provide the housing units that we desperately need. Um, relative to reducing, so reducing the square footage of the building in that dimension uh, obviously we don't think is called for with an easement to the north of, of the building. I think reducing the square footage over all five floors of the building relative to the street um, reduces number of units, reduces number of affordable units. Uh, and again, our bylaw um, uh, allows for and calls for uh, zero lot lines on the street, which is the historic norm of every building facing the town common. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, Maria. Um, thanks for the presentation and um, to sort of answer Doug's uh, question about the, what is that, the West setback. Um, I actually think, you know, we've come across this before where we need to really consider the location of the street curb and not necessarily property line because um, the sidewalk sort of wiggles and as it um, goes from parcel to parcel. And I think with this um, right-of-way improvement, there's actually quite a bit of pedestrian public space now. And I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with that. I, that. That's what the last meeting I was hoping to see was, was presented tonight. Um, it's literally just, you know, how much of the right-of-way can you give back to both the people using the building and the people walking past? And this provides plenty of breathing room. So if you look at the SV, the site plan, um, you know, it varies from 20 feet to almost 40 as we go wider. So I'm comfortable with the west where it is. Um, as far as the north, um, we just don't know what's going to happen on that adjacent parcel. And it, it really seems like this could set a precedent to lead to more, you know, density downtown. So I, I'm not too concerned with the five because I feel, you know, the next project or or whatever whoever comes by um we'll take that to account and you know we'll either um put their building or you know place it accordingly as far as access and light and making it look um appropriate for the creating this continuity that uh, i think this project does actually um with the project to its south um 
as far as just to touch on, you didn't really ask about this, though, but just to touch on the cemetery side, I agree. I don't think that, um, you know, what's what's there now is really uh, an eyesore. And so I think this is a great improvement to the east side of the parcel. And um, I agree. I, I'm not too concerned about it getting further away from that fence. I think the loss of housing units would be um, more of a detriment to this project than that sort of space that um, would be created that's not really usable and is not really as much of the um, sort of, you know, um, downtown defining kind of edge that we're trying to make really great um, on the west. Um, I guess my only questions, um, yeah, the lighting looked fine. I appreciated the lighting plan. That was sort of a missing piece from last time. Um, and I guess um, this right of way thing, uh, I don't, uh, maybe it's a question with Chris. Do we need to comment on it tonight or can we just assume we'll be brought back a new, more detailed plan? I I'm not clear on the process for that piece, but I really do appreciate having this sort of um, conceptual design for it. And um, I'm all for it. I think that's great. It really adds so much to the project. Um, so uh, that's it for now. <laughs> Maria, I have a question for you. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, on the, the North facade and with the DRB? Mm -hmm. uh, thoughts on, on breaking it up. Right. Again, it's a similar thing with, you know, we don't know what's going to happen on the, the adjacent parcel. So it's, you know, whether it creates a sort of urban space there or if it butts up against it, we just, it's hard to guess that. But for now, looking at it from a distance, um, it, it feels like it's broken up enough and has enough angles that um, they've done a nice job of breaking up that long facade. Um, it, it's a tough conundrum for a lot of architects to break up you know like we saw that at university drive with the long uh was it north and south facades and um you really have to be creative to do that and i think they've done a nice job with the fenestration as far as um breaking up and i think the drb suggestion of the controlled the lines coming down will really help as well because it'll have this more sort of um systematic way of breaking up the facade, you know, instead of just curtains going, you know, whichever width they want. Um, this will really help that facade look really tidy and very sort of, um, yeah, a little more neat. So um, I, I, I'd never, I mean, elevations, again, I think I mentioned this, are very abstract. You never see it on the flat like that. And it makes it look really long. When in fact, that west facade is angling away from, you know, it's kind of, an abstraction. So it actually won't look that long the way that um, North Elevation is portrayed. So I think the 3D perspectives show it really well. And um, yeah, I, I don't have an issue with that North side. Okay. Thank you. So we have Janet and then, oh, Chris, I'm sorry, I put you front. And then we have Janet and Andrew. I was just going to answer um, Maria's question about um, what the planning board's role is with the right of way. So the planning board doesn't necessarily have a formal role with um, the design of the right of way because it's on the town property, but the planning board could um, uh, include a condition that asks to see the design of this right of way area as it evolves and then um, have, have an opportunity to comment on it. So we could con condition it that way, if you would like. You know, Chris, uh, just thinking off the, Coffee, it would be really nice if they could kind of combine this right of way work with, with you know, bumping out the one East Pleasant pinch point there a little bit. Um, just put that in the hopper, but um, maybe it could be one, one project. So um, not that I'm uh, volunteering Kyle to pay for, <laughs> for that, but um, uh, all right, thank you. So uh, Janet and then Andrew. So I, I would like to support what Doug has been saying. And um, one of the things I, I was hoping to see, and I, you know, we could see is a picture of somebody standing at the, make it the thing, the Northwest corner. If you're walking, if a pedestrian's coming up the street, kind of at the corner, what is, what do they see? Um, you know, looking straight ahead, looking at the building, you know, different perspectives on that. Cause I think that what a lot of people have commented on, architects and, and lay people, is that sense of, you know, a really looming building right up on the street. And I do appreciate the adding of the public way. Um, I think it gets it it really does make it feel more open. But I just don't think it's 
it's going to be enough to prevent anyone standing there coming up feeling like this building really is pushing onto the street. And I think that, you know, I'd be, I think the side plaza doesn't seem to me like a workable space. And if there was more space out front, if the building was set back by 10 feet, it could be more communal space. There could be room for tables. There could be room for, you know, seating that faces each other. Um, you know, and I would actually recommend instead of just the trees, which of course I love trees, is to add some some planting, some flowers. Um, think about like the Henyan block and how inviting that is with kind of a mix of um, flowers and shrubs and trees. And you see people gathering there all the time. And I think that would be a huge add to this area of town that really lacks any kind of public communal space and maybe shrinking the plaza and, you know, the side plaza and bringing it out front. Um, I do think that this, this setback, the 10 foot setback, which is um, a requirement, but does have footnote A on it, on the north side should be 10 feet. I, I think on when he's pleasant, when you look where the bollards are, that is a really narrow place for pedestrians to be walking along. And I think about carrying bags or pushing a stroller or two people trying to pass each other in different directions. And it's really, I think about snow and, you know, an umbrella, people just, it just seems way too narrow for people. And so I think on the west side, if there was a 10 foot setback, there'd be space for people to pass each other safely and in, not in a kind of like we're getting by each other like rodents and also there's space for trees. And, and you know, what, one of the requirements is that when you have a residential building adjoining commercial space that there be a buffer of vegetation and that's really missing here. Um, and then 11 East Pleasant seems to be providing that vegetative buffer for one East Pleasant and one East Pleasant also has a vegetative buffer on the other side. And so it sort of softens, I think it will soften the facade. And I completely agree. I feel like I'm in this huge run on paragraph, but I do think the West um, perspective is just, it, to me, it's just huge. I mean, I think it just feels like a big blocky mass. I have like an ocean liner feeling and I don't, I think there's been some attempt to tweak it, but I think for us lay people, it just looks like a big box. And, you know, could you change the color of the first two floors to be the darker brick? Could you change the plane? Um, you know, the, the design review board, some people suggested a step back for the first, the front facade and the rear facade, is there some way to make it look less like one big box? And so, so I, I would, I would support what Doug is saying as to the front setback and the side setback. Thank you, Jana. Uh, Andrew? Thanks, Jack. Thanks for the presentation, Kyle. Um, I, let's see, we got a couple sort of thoughts here. Um, so one, I'm just, I, I wasn't at the last meeting, so just I appreciate sort of you responding to some of our earlier comments about the affordable housing and the added retail space. So, so thanks for doing that. I think the building is beautiful. Um, I think that, um, you know, it's, I, I, it's, I like going after Doug and Janet because they often give me some, some additional thoughts. I think the West, the, the right way, like I don't have any concerns with that. I, I think actually the glass will help make it feel uh, much more open and airy than One East Pleasant, which to me is really like the large brick up on the sidewalk that you have to like avoid. I think this actually might be, might be kind of inviting. I know we've said in the past like that we shouldn't consider Kendrick Park across the street really in the same conversation as this, but I imagine that there will be a lot of people who, if, when they want that green space, um, it's like literally across the crosswalk that that's being added there. So I, I think that you could see some spill over there. I suspect you'll see a fair amount given the number of, uh, of housing units that are here. Um, I thought the view sort of from the North um, and you had another rendering that kind of was from the West. It actually, seeing those renderings actually made me feel more comfortable about this, that it, it like it literally closes the loop of One East Pleasant, right? But it didn't. It didn't have the overbearing uh, appearance, which I was kind of worried about. And I think, like you would, you would often think that that's going to happen when you're putting a five-story building uh, here. Um, so I, I was, I was good with that. I think, you know, Janet, I've been processed and Doug, your your comments around the north, getting some vegetation there and having a vegetative buffer. I think that there. I think that the building facade is, is, is is you know sort of pleasant and dynamic that it maybe 
could account for the fact that there isn't aren't trees planted in there, but it would be really nice if we could get some sort of even some something green there, maybe some ivy or something to that effect, just to um, get get the vegetation without maybe requiring um, eating uh, without putting a, a larger burden on setback. Because I understand uh, you're you're juggling a pretty big math uh, equation here to to make um, all of the units fit to accommodate the affordable, to accommodate the retail and fit it within the footprint. Um, I was curious, I think there's some emails that went on this, so I apologize if I missed it, but on the Eastern building facade, were there plans to put a mural or commission some artwork similar to what, what's at Gwenny's Pleasant? Kyle? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, no, there's no plan for a, a Okay, okay, I mean, I-, I The grade's significantly think... higher. Okay. I, I did not join the site plan yesterday, so I apologize for that. I did go by today, and um, I haven't been in the cemetery very much at all. I thought that the mural was really nice, but um, yeah, it it looks like a dumpster fire back there. So I agree. I think um, right now that uh, Maria said it well in terms of anything's really an improvement. I think it will will make it look much better there. And um, and yeah, so the, the 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 folks who reside in the cemetery will have a pleasant more pleasant view. Um, <laughs> Overall, yeah, I, I, I would say one, one question and a half. I know that um, like I know that we're in the municipal parking district, but I was just curious, like where do you think? I know you don't need to accommodate this, but I'm curious, where do you think people will park? And then an add-on to that would just be, uh, and we may get to this later, I apologize if, if I'm getting ahead of turn, is, is the, the staging area and the, um, the pub building is, is do you have a, a future plan in mind for those spaces as well? And, and is that something that could potentially in the future become uh, be, become parking for these residents? Yeah, sure. I know I, I, I posed that question uh, as well, Andrew. Okay, yeah, apologies uh, if, I, if I'm repeating. Yeah, that. yeah. So Kyle, why don't you repeat your answer on that? Sure, so uh, the intent is not to have parking on the spot where the pub is. Um, a private parking lot is is not allowed in the bylaw, as I understand it, as it would be there. I, and that's not our intent. Um, I think that the people that live in this building will have you know, options for parking or not having a car. Um, and when you are attempting to do so much in such, you know, less than one half of 1% of the total land mass of the town of Amherst, in terms of all of the, you know, future housing pressure getting push there because of our bylaw that we have a whole bunch of things coming together and parking is the thing that is um uh and uh, is secondary to housing i think our housing crisis is such that we really need the units i think that you're seeing that play out around the country in areas where there's a high barrier to entry and there hasn't been enough sufficient housing to meet demand um that that uh um, that those those conversations are being had Obviously there's the downtown parking permit, um, which we've all discussed many times and the relatively very low cost of that. Um, and then there's, um, I imagine there's other options for folks who are here um, in terms of having a car, not having a car, using ride share and so on. Um, relative to the North uh, setback, I just wanna restate that the bylaw allows for zero, uh, zero foot, no setback side yards in the entire BG. And the intent of that is to replicate what is um, around the town common, where there are buildings cheek to jowl next to each other, zero, 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 zero. Um, it reflects a desire for density. It reflects the understanding of what a downtown BG district is, which is dense and, and pedestrian. It also, um, if you do zero set lax, you're obviously not doing parking on the site because you have no location for a curb cut you know, unless you're bringing it in through the front of the building. So in this case, we have an easement to the north. There's a 17 foot wide easement that serves the bank next door that is another property owner um, that is immediately north of this building. So yes, we have a five foot setback, but that five foot setback to the north of that is a 17 foot easement, which remains open for access and, and, uh, and egress. Thank you. Uh, Tom, please. And then Janet. Sure. I just had a quick comment that kind of piggybacked on a lot of people's comment and a little bit of the DRB. Um, 
I'm hearing um, Janet and Doug um, in, in reference to some sort of front setback. So here on the east side, um, the DRB had also talked about how do we get a little more space on that front um, public area. I think I heard Janet mention that. Um, I, I, I guess what I would say is I, I don't want to set a precedent for needing a setback there because I'm actually not afraid of the building being flush at the upper level um, and maintaining an upper level streetscape. I do think in this case, it would be nice to imagine what five to 10 feet on that lower level would look like. I know we'd be sacrificing space somewhere, um, whether that's storage, bike storage in the back somewhere, or whether that's, um, you know, uh, support space for the retail, I don't know. Um, but to give us an extra five or 10 feet on that front space at the ground floor, um, I would like to see that. And again, I, I don't, I don't think that we need that. I, I don't think I would support a, a building set back there, but I would um, support if uh, the, the group, if we decided to try to get more space on that ground floor. Um, so Tom, I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not clear on what, what you said there. So, with so the garden, setting back the retail facade, setting in, um, pushing the retail facade inward to get more plaza space out front. Okay. Not, not the upper floors. No. Okay. Um, you're talking about pushing this line back here. Yeah. Yeah. Which again, I know we lose retail and I know there's yeah. a lot of comments about retail. Um, but I think there's also a lot of public comment about that, that, that the, the feeling of being squeezed out into the road. And, and I think that, um, I can also imagine how people would use that space out front and mimicking your park benches across the way on in, you know, underneath that overhang could also draw people to the retail. It's not really going to block um, a door here or there. So anyway, just, just a thought about expanding that slightly and, and trying to figure out how you remedy that situation. I would, I would, I would like to see that and, and wonder if other people support that. Interesting. Thank you, Tom. Um, Janet and then Maria. So I'm, I'm a little confused. Like when I read the dimensional table three, it says basic minimum, um, minimum, basic minimum side and rear yard 10 feet in the BG. And then um, there's a, a footnote A, which says that the board may reduce it under, you know, sort of hazy conditions. And so to me, it seems like the side setbacks should be 10 feet and there are good reasons for that. And so also uh, jumping a little bit into the special permit and away from the SPR, um, we do have, the planning board does have the, um, we can add a condition increasing setbacks, um, you know, front side or whatever, um, we, we can require greater than the minimum. So I just wanted to point those two things out. Um, in terms of pushing, so I, I actually think the building is too much too close to the front street, but as to Tom's point about, you know, pushing back the retail, I don't think that we need to lose retail um, even if that is done because there's a lot of space in the, you know, kind of the lobby space and kind of, it looks, you know, to me that looks like that would be prime for more retail. And I was gonna later, I don't wanna go through so many issues. I think that we do need at least 40% of business space. I don't know if it has to be retail, it could be different kinds of offices, um, but I think, you know, we don't wanna lose that we're already, we're already losing, you know, three or four businesses on this site, and we're losing the pub on the site next door. We've lost twelve of fifteen. Um, we need to keep space for businesses, and so. But I do think, I do, you know, think that ten foot setback in the front would be helpful. I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by Tom's idea of just moving the retail space back, but I wouldn't want to lose that. In fact, I'd like to increase that. Thank you, uh, Maria. Please. Um, I've been looking at my screen. I haven't been following along a mouse, but I'm a little confused about everyone's comments about the street side. Um, if I go to SVE's drawing and look at the scale of 20 feet and then look at the plan, it looks like there's 24, 25 feet at the north end. And then, like I said earlier, nearly 40 feet at the south end if you go from the corner of the building toward the street. So I'm not sure where these pinch points are that people are talking about. They're, 
there are, there are a row of ballers in the north, and um, so there's that one sidewalk that goes to that um, door that goes into, I think it was the lobby. I'm on a different plan. I'm on the SBE plan. Um, so I guess with 20 feet, I feel pretty comfortable. That's not a pinch point unless I'm missing something um, because you can walk on the concrete sidewalk and you can walk on the right of way. Uh, what is that point to? Let's see. It says number three, but I think what it is is um, those large granite per paper pieces. So I'm, I'm, I, yeah, I guess I want clarity from the board. Like, what do you mean by pinch point? Um, because it's literally 20 feet at the north and then 40 some at the south. Um, Maria, I'm not sure that, that anyone mentioned a pinch point. I, I, I mentioned that for one East Pleasant, but that okay. that, that was not for oh, oh, sure. this proposal. But not for 11? Yeah. No, okay, no, so, I, I don't think anyone's right. saying well, there's I, a pinch okay. point here. Uh, I don't I okay. don't think so. And then then my other, okay, yeah. Okay, well then my other comment is that, uh, oh, so what I'm saying is I don't know that we need to widen the uh, space on the West by reducing the amount of retail. I guess that's, that was what I was getting a sense of that we should push that west wall further east that um, only the first floor I'm, I'm not clear on why we would need to do that um and the other point i forget who said it but it was like saying that this project's like uh filling in a missing tooth i think i think that's right on point because you know on the town common we have those big blocks where there are zero setbacks and it creates what everyone always points to when they say what they love about downtown these two big block buildings um and so i think that this project you know although it's not zero it is continuing this sort of um uh, this continuity that creates a nice sense of place across from kendrick park so uh, i mean uh, similar to um chris brestrup's findings you know i feel it's a very uh it works really well with um Sorry, it's kind of lame. It, 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 create, it does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain, to the use. I mean, all the findings talking about the setbacks, saying that they don't create disharmony um, and that they work with the existing use, scale, and architecture of the buildings in the vicinity. I agree with all of that. And um, I would just hate to keep pushing and pushing the project smaller and smaller and losing more affordable units, more housing units. Um, I, I feel like we've seen the same project and that we've gotten more and more information and tonight we got even more and in my mind I've gotten the information I need and um, and yeah so I, I just I, I think it's it's there I know that there's some hesitation about the street gate but with that right of way I, I feel like that really resolves a lot of the um, issues about you know the pedestrian scale and how people experience this building walking past it so um, so yeah I, I feel like I uh, Jack, I do think some people did say, you know, like um, the West still needs more space, and um, I'm I'm not sure I see that, honestly. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I was just using the terminology pinch point that I know I, I used, uh, but it wasn't for this uh, uh, project. But uh, good comments, Maria. Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, Chris. Did you have your hand up? Yes. I had my hand up, but I don't remember why. So I okay. All right. So we have Doug and then Janet. Yeah, I wanted to just say thank you to my colleagues on the board for their responses to my question, uh, asking about the setback potential on the west side. Um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not really sure I'm advocating that, but I thought it was worth talking about because this is the time for us to, to make a decision if we wanted to do that. Um, and we certainly did get a lot of comments from a lot of people in, uh, you know, in the public hearing parts of this, uh, you know, this process asking us to push, push the building back. So uh, thank you for that, for those responses. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, necessarily going to advocate for it from this point on. Um, and then uh, Kyle, I guess I will ask one question about the easement. And that is, is that a perpetual easement that you and your team as owners of this project can retain in perpetuity? Uh, it's a good question. That's an existing easement uh, that 
uh, was put in place when the bank property was, as I understand, when the bank property was split off from the other five properties that we're discussing. So that easement is in place and it serves the bank and we don't want to impose on that or impose on the bank in any way, shape or form, nor do we have the uh, rights or desire to. So there's no intent to change that existing easement. But, but you have access, you have rights to pass in that easement and that is yes. a right that you retain as an owner of that property. Correct. So if you're driving in here, this easement serves the bank. It serves this property, which is four parcels. And it serves the parcel it's on, which is the pub parcel. Okay, so so no one can take that away from you. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doug. Janet. So, Doug, the easement could be extinguished if um, um, Harrison Street or um, bought that property, and so you know, if they owned all the parcels, they could extinguish that easement and kind of reconfigure things, but that would be down the road. So it's, they're not, and, this, and the easement doesn't live forever necessarily, but um, can live a very long time. Um, so I think it would be useful to have pictures from that Northwest corner, like what a pedestrian sees, um, and then also um, from Prey Street, because um, what other peds will see, and we don't really have those views. I do appreciate the public space. I do feel like it's still going to be sort of dark and looming. Um, and so, and, and obviously if the building gets pushed back or, you know, we have a 10 foot setback on the west side, um, there's less space inside the building. There could be more units depending on the configuration, um, you know, maybe less, probably less profit. But so I just, I do think that, um, I, I just think, we should do the setbacks. Um, I wonder also, Jack, this is sort of a um, thing. I know we have a lot of people in the audience and we're talking about the setbacks. I haven't even talked about the rear setbacks. I want to like push that off, but would it make sense to take comment on this or are we gonna have people wait to like the very end? Cause we sort of have a, this is like a package here of public space. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've been having some very healthy discussions. I think, um, I mean, I, I haven't really totally chimed in. I, uh, I don't know that we've, um, who, well, uh, Andrew spoken, Johanna, uh, but I think we're, we're very close to getting some public comment. Uh, but I, if, if I can say, I, you know, I was intrigued by, by Doug's proposal to move it back. And then I think Tom had a, an interesting, um, um, you know, addendum to that, but it, it is, it is, you know, significantly wide open, similar to what we see, I think, in the in the other, um, you know, wider areas as you go toward Main Street, uh, say in front of, uh, you know, Henyons and and, th and areas like that, and then I, again, Kendrick Park is just right there. It just it really I think will have a very open feel to it uh, with regard to the set the side setbacks. Um, I, we're looking at this, you know, wonderful, like green alley, you know, toward the cemetery. I think it's going to be gorgeous. Um, with regard to the rear setback, it, I, I agree. It's like an, uh, eyesore dumpster fire. I mean, it, it is this ugly and unfortunately there's some trees screening it from the cemetery. Um, and those trees will be replaced by, you know, younger trees, but I, I do feel like aesthetically, from the cemetery that you're going to have a very nice looking building compared to what we have now. And so I, I, I you know, I, I think um, I'm okay with that 10 feet uh, rear setback. Um, and I guess that's just, just some of my, you know, cursory comments on this at this point in time. So um, Janet, did you wanna? If I, if I could I oh, Jack, just real quickly, just to make sure um, there's been make sure everybody's aware that these this brick column and all the brick columns in the retail space as they rise up and go through that wood ceiling there's led lights around that column so those columns are lit at the top um so it's a uh it's a uh, uh it's intentionally a design feature that allows for this outdoor space to uh have a very pleasant ambient light 
Downcast, of course. Correct. Uh, Janet. Oh, in terms of the, the, the rear setback, um, I think it's easy to think, oh my God, what a nightmare for that back area because the landowner for some reason has let it become a trash pit and I, I hope the town, you know, I, I wonder why that has been allowed to happen. Um, so I think that the view from the cemetery of 1 East Pleasant Street, 11 East Pleasant Street is just gonna look like a canyon and it's pretty shocking. I had some, I was visiting the cemetery, Emily Dickinson's grave with some friends and we just were, you know, looking at the cemetery and we just turned around and it was just, I think one East Pleasant Street was being built and it was like, we almost stepped back. We just kind of reared back because it was seemed so, such a contrast. And I think the um, historical commission pretty much agrees. They, they kind of went along with the 10 foot setback but they preferred the 20 um, on the design review board. I don't remember her name. I want to say Sean or Schwan. The architect kept on talking about a set a step back of the top floors to make it less kind of intense. And so, I also think if it was a twenty foot setback, which um, is, as we know, the requirement for that spot, it could be great space for the tenants. There's no real space on this thing for people to sit. The plaza is kind of small. The front plaza, I think, could be a place if it's bigger but there's no real green space or outdoor amenities for the tenants in this, in this um, plan. And that could be a great seating area for tenants. Um, they could have tables, they could you know, have lights and the whole thing or you know, whatever, um, a place to go. And I think the importance of a place to go, most of us experience in our own homes. But I think that, you know, I looked at one East Pleasant Street and I thought, where did people go during the pandemic? I mean, I think an, a possible place to go would be um, where the drain, not that I have the wrong word, where the sweat, the, um, the water recharge area is, that's a pretty big green space, but there's nothing on this site for people who live here to, to go anywhere outside. And um, that's a requirement of site plan review and special permit. I love the idea of Kendrick Park is there, but you know, the, the landowner has to provide the space and Kendrick Park isn't open after dark. And so people can't do recreation there after 4.30 on a, on a, in a winter's night or, you know, the sun goes down earlier. And so I think that, um, so I, I just think the rear setback is a great spot for, for the tenants and also to soften the impact of this very large building on a very historic cemetery. Yeah, so if we, if we zoom in on the rear setback issue, we've gotten a couple of uh, uh, letters or memos, one from KP Law, one from uh, Kyle's, Turney, I don't want to mispronounce his name, but Bobrowski perhaps, uh, which which I think are pretty uh, convincing that that we are as a planning board, I think, uh, you know, within, uh, you know, a safe area in terms of approving the 10 foot, uh, the 20 foot. Uh, again, if it was prescriptive, it would not be coming in front of the planning board. I mean, it would just Rob Moore would be approving it and we'd be done sort of thing. But this is to the taking all in account. Uh, and I think that reconstruction for a uh, term kind of opens it up that Joel Bard mentioned in his memo. So again, that gives me, you know, some, some ease with regard to the decision to, to keep it at 10 versus trying to get more back there. And again, I personally, I've been in Amherst for 20 years. I, I, I have been, not been in that cemetery until this project. Um, I, I, I know there's a lot of people that frequently, but, and it's a, it's a, it's a, I know it's a, um, it's a highlight for the town because of its historic nature, but I'm just thinking of like cemeteries in downtown Boston that are dwarfed by who knows what. And, you know, that doesn't really, I don't think detract from, uh, uh, these the historic nature of the cemeteries and people wanting to, to see things so I just I mean um, I don't know so uh, Maria yeah I totally agree Jack I think all those memos from the various councils um, well the SEL council uh, completely convinced me that we it's within our right to just sort of understand this project the space limitations it has and um, yeah, I'm fine, especially with this latest rendering called Image 001, uh, showing it from the cemetery. It, it looks great. Um, and I think stepping back to the top floor would actually look like a mistake. I think if you were to look at the building 
some other angles, it would look like this sort of notch in this really sort of uh, beautiful, simple form. It would just kind of make it look like, what, why is that there, you know, kind of thing. And so I, I feel like the tension on the street side um, is the most important. And um, again, this is such a valuable, you know, amount of downtown has such minimal amount of usable, buildable space and to give it up to open space when Hendrick Park is there seems a little backwards. But again, I, I don't think it would set a precedent saying, you know, other projects don't need to provide open space. It's just because this parcel is so strange, long and narrow that it really seems like it should be taking advantage of this adjacent open space and use its own parcel for as much sort of amenities for the people on the site, people walking by the site, people, you know, sitting outside on that sort of town right away space. Um, uh, yeah, I, th I think that's, those are my two points on amendment. Yeah. And, it, um, yeah, I, and I, I mean, I don't, I know, you know, there's many neighbors that, that utilize the, the cemetery. I don't want to say it's again, I, I'm impressed by it, but it, it, it's, um, I didn't see very many people there when we were on the site visit, you know, um, you know, it, it is, it is a resource, but if I'm in the cemetery, I'm kind of looking at the gravestones and I'm not looking along the perimeter of a cemetery. I, that's not why I'm there. Um, uh, and, and it's just, you know, there's, it's rich with regard to, um, you know, the things that cemeteries bring in terms of history. Um, but, uh, hey, I'm, I'm wondering if now would be a good time to take a short break and kind of like, um, um, kind of regroup, uh, get some public comment, unless there's, you know, probably about time for that. But let's take a little recess and come back at, you know, around, you know, 810. Does that sound good? All right, so everyone just uh, take their video off, put themselves on mute, and we'll reconvene.
Maria, is your hand up still or? He may not be back, Jack. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll just lower it. Jack, I can never see Maria or her hand, so I'm so happy you can. Yeah. Oh, you can't see it, Pam? I've been hitting I, star nine and sometimes it goes through and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, I'm sure with star nine, I don't know that you can actually lower it. <laughs> No problem. Oh well, if yeah, if you can lower it for me, that'd be great. I yeah, I I've been toggling mute with the mute button, but I didn't know do, I might be able to just hit star nine again. You're doing a great job, Maria. What is mm -hmm. like two, two o'clock? Oh my god. Uh, yeah, but I, I'm currently <laughs> making a pot of coffee, so um, I can go another two hours, no problem. <laughs> two a.m. Yeah, Good. I had like a four-hour-long hike today too, so. I'm, Physically and mentally, uh, a little sick, oh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. this is worth it to me. So, yeah. Keep going. Wow. I'll take a long nap tomorrow. Are there a lot of, uh, what do you call it, attendees? I, you know, I have no sense of that. Uh, there's 10. No. Oh, oh, I would have thought there'd be a lot I more. Yeah. You were an attendee, and no, you're not. You're a panelist. No, just a quantity. I no sense. Mm -hmm. 10, huh? Okay. So we got everybody back, I believe, huh? So Pam, you wanna flip us back? I am I am flipping us back. I'm just looking to make sure I see everyone except for Maria, but I know she's here because I hear her. So okie doke. Carry on. Okay, um, so we're returning from, from a short break here and I would like to open this up to public comment and give people uh, a chance to, to raise their hands. And I see Pam Rooney, number one. So Pam, why, why don't you uh, begin? And state your name and address, please. Hi, Pam. Hi, Pam. Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Thanks for letting me speak. Um, I have a couple questions and then maybe people could respond after I finish. Um, I heard one East Pleasant Street mentioned in something about maybe widening the green space. Um, who, who could pay for that? Is that actually a project underway? And hopefully the town doesn't have to pay for that mistake. Um, Mr. Wilson, could we see the, the North facade, please. One of those images that you had up was really helpful. Or whoever is, whoever is. Um, what would you like to see, Pam? If we could see the, the images again of the building. And there was a great image, a recent one of the north facade of the building. From uh, where the, show uh, the bike rack, show the bike rack. From, probably from North Pleasant Street or East Pleasant Street. Kyle, do you want to do that or do you want me to try? I could do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It's easier to talk about it as, as we see it. So, oh, uh, Pam, since there's a little, there's a pause perfect, here. Perfect. Um, the, 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 the one East Pleasant Street, I mean, Chris can correct me, but that was, that was built um, consistent with the, the zero offset. So and there was no mistake there, but, you know, perspective wise. I thought, know, I, just, it, I, thought I, I thought I heard some discussion about maybe the town was going to be uh, Ameliorate, that's all right. ameliorating that that horrible situation but maybe and not. I, I just threw that out there as like on my wish list you know uh, but it, it would be on the I would be on the town's nickel it, there's not a mistake by okay. archipelago it, it was proposed reviewed it's definitely um, so thank you mr. Wilson for showing this image so um, uh, in all of the public meetings that we've that we've been listening since 
May, I think, there has been a concern expressed by many, many people that the north facade of this building is pretty massive. And um, sadly, I have not heard any or seen any um, ramifications or, or um, modification of this plan by the architects to actually respond to some of those concerns. There's a slash that you describe, which in this picture is completely blocked by, uh, it's by the bank. So it's insignificant as far as a, a spatial defined definition. And it occurs to me that even if you took your gray zinc and utilized the gray zinc as the, as the material for the fourth or fifth floor, that it would in fact help break up some of that height and width of facade. And I'd like to have the, the board discuss something like that. That seems like a very low cost change that would actually uh, affect some um, something. We have, a, there's, a, there's a 15 foot high or 12 to 15 foot high brick wall on that north facade that the pedestrians have to walk along. And again, it's just, I would love to see some movement from Archipelago to address the issue of this bulkiness and the blockiness, and nobody seems to be holding your feet to the fire. Um, the question is, there was another good image that I think Mr. Jemsik described as a wonderful green alley going between uh, 11 East Pleasant Street and 1 East Pleasant Street that, that um, a doesn't really reflect what your new plan shows, so it's a little misleading. Um, but it occurs to me that, in fact, because 11 East Pleasant Street doesn't really get to utilize this strip of green, the strip of uh, Armstrong maples on its south side, it is really all to the benefit of 11 of 1 East Pleasant Street. Why not push the whole building? Since, since you refuse to give up uh, the setback, the side setbacks, let's take, let's take the south setback and make it zero or, or five, and let's make the north side the 10-foot setback as it should be. That is the side that the public will actually see. The public will not see the benefit or get the benefit of this green alley um, on, on the south side of the building. So let's flip it and give the public actually something that it can see from a distance, which will help soften that huge north facade. Um, lastly, I guess the, the interpretation of, of section 9.22, which allows um, you know, a full override of, of non-conformity. I know the town has put this to some good use, but it concerns me greatly that uh, 9.22 can be used in any case where there is a non-conforming use. Um, in, in some cases, even to allow uh, inappropriate uses or uh, setbacks that cannot be really controlled by a board. So I would love to hear some feedback on this very, very broad general interpretation of 9.22. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Um, why don't we have Kyle, if you're willing to uh, speak to some of those points. Um, I, I think that obviously the intent, we have a 80 foot wide site, we've got a 60 foot wide building. Um, we've worked really hard to create a situation where there's a new view back to the cemetery that currently does not exist because the Piper building blocks it and all of Cousins Market blocks it. So we've in, uh, worked hard to, to provide that. I think that the trees obviously serve um, both buildings, serve the courtyard and will obviously be apparent by the pedestrians um, on the street and anywhere um, uh, in, the, in the rendering here. Okay, um, and uh, you have Nina. Nina, um, state your name and address. Hi, Nina. 
Yes, hello. Um, Nina Weil, 103 High Street in Amherst. Thank you. Um, I, I actually have one question first, and um, Kyle, I'm not quite sure if you're from Archipelago or from the architectural firm that designed the building. He's Archipelago. Okay, and who who it, who are the architects who designed the building? Uh, Kyle. Uh, they're shown on the plans here, Moda Studio. Yes, and I can't read the address or anything. I've no idea. Uh, where they're in Fayetteville, Arkansas. They're in Arkansas. <laughs> so I, I guess I, I also was wondering why, why we can't use a more local architect. Uh, Modus just won a national AIA design award for housing. Um, we've we've uh, worked with them based on their broad experience and, uh, and skill. Okay. So I, uh, all I really want to talk about is the west uh, facade, and um, I, I um, agree a lot with what Janet McGowan was saying. I actually feel there is a bit of a pinch point right there at that northwest corner, um, where the lower level comes almost flush to the facade of the rest of the building. And the uh, sidewalk um, cuts back toward the building. So, so to me, that, that is kind of a pinch point. And um, I do want to say something about the whole front plaza. In the rest of downtown, we have curbside parking. And that may sound like, oh, but cars are ugly and who wants curbside parking? But Stationary cars are much quieter than moving cars. Stationary cars kick up less dirt and dust than moving cars and create a little sense of buffer and safety. So even though I really do appreciate that there's been a big effort to enlarge that public space, um, I still feel it's a bit skimpy, especially that pinched corner, it kind of funnels in and just when you kind of want it to be gracious and open and inviting. Um, I'm a little concerned about the big overhang at the um, west um, south corner with that big round column, but may maybe, maybe that would work for retail. And I'd like to see the first floor plan and just see how much retail there is, if we could see the floor plan of the ground level. Kyle, you wanna? Uh, first floor. Do you want me to just do it as, as public comment come in or do you want me to do it all kind of at the wrap here? Uh, I, I think we're, we're doing well with just, okay. you know, one-on-one -on -one here. Sure. Um, so is all the pink retail? Uh, we have listed the 1700 square foot retail space. We have 500 square foot back of house. We have a leasing lounge, leasing, fitness, parcel, bike, uh, hot water, electric, storage, trash, and service all in pink. I see. We have a lobby and um, uh, affiliated spaces and hallways in yellow. And then we have residential units in blue. Oh, I see. So the lobby is this um, facing facing the south. This, this that's the main lobby entrance facing south there. Yeah. And the yeah. entrance is right below it, right there. And there's one to the north. You can come into the lobby either side. Uh huh. Uh huh. So is, you kind of point I'm out. I'm drawing a circle. Actually, I'm drawing a circle around. Is that the retail? Is that show uh, up? Yes, that, that is 1,700 square foot retail and 500 square foot back of house that would serve. Okay. So that's probably for one client. I uh, see only one tenant, hopefully, yes. Tenant, one tenant. All okay. right, well, thank you, Nina. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much.
Uh, uh, Elizabeth Verling, please. State your name and address. Hi, Liz. Yes, uh, this is Elizabeth Verling at 36 Cottage Street. Uh, thank you for recognizing me. Um, I've already stated this in uh, letters that I've written to various people, but um, I just wanted to say that I think the, the view of the north side and also the views of the, of the public way are somewhat misleading um, in the sense that knowing that I walk by this routinely multiple times a week, um, basically this space is no wider than what is um, in front of that uh, northwest corner of one East Pleasant, which is not very much. Um, I'd also like to reiterate what um, Ms. Wiles just said, is that um, those benches are basically sitting where buses are gonna be pulling in, um, if I understand correctly, where, where they stand. So I don't think those benches are going to be very appealing right there up against the street. Um, and looking at national standards, um, national standards are for eight foot sidewalks in this type of area. So maybe the fact that we have six foot sidewalks for the town is just because these are old regulations and we should be rethinking, rethinking that. I also just wanted to say that I don't think that, I think the idea of saying, oh, this is just the same kind of buildings that are up against the sidewalk in the A.J. Hastings block, um, that's really not the case. In that block, we have multiple small storefronts. Um, the ground floor is broken up from the upper floors and those buildings are only three stories tall. So this is a very different look and feel. And I really would like, um, you know, Doug Marshall and Janet McGowan to push more for additional setback, which I think would make this front space um, be able to have more green than just trees sticking out of the grate. Um, and I find it a little bit disingenuous that the zoning bylaws are applied when they're convenient and they're not applied when they're not convenient, like the 20 foot setback from the, from the cemetery. I agree that I don't care if we give another 10 feet to the cemetery, but I would like to give another 10 feet to the public. And that would also be set back consistent with the spoke and with um, the former Bertucci's becoming whatever it's becoming, that would be more consistent with the setback on those buildings. So rather than using one East Pleasant as the precedent for setback, let's use the setback on these other buildings. Um, I realize it's the same setback as the bank, but the bank's only one story. That's way different than five stories. So thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I see no other hands from the public at this time. So turning it back to uh, the board, uh, I see Janet's hand and then uh, Doug's hand. Hey, hey, Kyle, no, your hand is not up, right, Kyle? No. All right, uh, Janet, please. Um, so I, I, and I know this is, it's hard to kind of manage the topics at these, um, these kind of hearings, but um, going to the legal analysis by KP Law, um, I, I was perplexed and a little befuddled by the two emails from um, KP Law. So what I was hoping for was what I think of as a regular legal analysis, which is what does the statute say what does the bylaw say? What do the cases say? What are the legal standards that we should apply? And then how do these legal st standards apply to the facts that we have? And so, um, and then you can figure out possible outcomes. And so that, that's what I was looking for. I, I know I had a wide net of questions, but they were all, hopefully they would have been answered in that normal kind of legal analysis. I also know that people don't like to answer my questions, which is why I keep asking them because I, I'm, I ask them with purpose. Um, so I would love to see a better and more clear legal analysis. I found it really hard to read 
the, I read the first email and I was like, huh, you know, and I had to go back and look. And I've done some research in this area. I read cases, I read Mr. Bobrowski's section on this several times. Um, I read enough to know that I needed to do more research. And then I also realized that's not really my job and no one's paying me. So I was hoping that KP Law could provide some depth and a little more clarity about 9.22. I know that the town is using this um, kind of as a way of ex what I see as pos a possible incorrect expansion of what could be should be allowed for non-conforming buildings. And so to me, that's a real, this is an important understanding and analysis. Um, after I read, so I was actually very confused and I read the second email and I was like, you know, this is too late in the afternoon. I can't sort this out. Um, and so I, I, I think that people or uh, lay people reading those emails could think, oh, it's okay. And I don't know how anyone could say why with any understanding of the law. And so I would love to get to kind of do a do over and get sort of a more clear um, sort of a traditional legal memo on this topic of um, I, I was left wondering after reading these, like when would a variance ever be needed? And, um, you know, it's, you know, can, you know, is, can we just take any non-conforming building and build anything in its place? And there's never a reason to go for a variance. And I know that's not true. And so I would love to see a more clear legal analysis um, that everyone can understand, including me. Um, and so, you know, I just, I don't, I don't know if I can get a do-over or just something a little bit more clear and traditional in terms of a legal memo on this. I, I didn't, I'm not trying to like push a point to say, you know, to say no. I don't know when I would say no and when I would say yes, based on those two emails, those coming kind of late in the day. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm not an attorney like you are, Janet, but um, I, I do know that uh, the way it's written, you know, I'm looking at KP Law's thing that that we can we can deliberate like we're doing now and decide whether uh, you know it's acceptable or not when it's not 20 foot. I think I think we got a clear path from the town's attorney. I mean, I don't know, I don't, I don't need additional research, you know, personally, um, but maybe the other board members, you know, feel differently, but uh, I have Doug and then Maria. Doug? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm not in a position to answer Janet's question i guess i would expect chris to be the one to tell us whether what she received from the town attorney is all we could reasonably expect from that attorney or whether uh you know that attorney just decided to send the, it in an email form because of time constraints or something else uh, but the comment i was going to make was um <clears throat> was, was uh, I guess, a follow-up to Elizabeth Veerling's comment. And that is um, probably also a question for Chris, uh, whether, whether this section of East Pleasant Street is ever likely to have or be able to accommodate parallel parking by vehicles along the travel way. And, um, also, uh, actually, I can't remember my second my second question. Oh, actually, yeah, it was about uh, the width of the sidewalk because I also find the six foot sidewalk to be kind of uh, I don't know uh, skimpy or you know minimal, and just extending that width from east from one East Pleasant Street, I would hope that we could eventually get to an eight foot sidewalk. And maybe that's part of refining the improvements in front of the building, uh, which I would be looking for when that, this comes back to us. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Maria. Oh, excuse me, Chris first and then Maria. Chris, you're muted. 
Sorry, um, I, I did ask Joel Bard for an analysis. I sent him Janet's questions. I sent him questions of my own and he came back with um, what he sent us, which is essentially that it's really up to the board to decide. And if the board can make a finding that what is being proposed is not more det detrimental to the neighborhood, then that can support the, um, the reduced setback on that side. It can support the um, declaration that it's a reconstruction of um, a non-conforming structure. And we do have um, Mark Bobrowski here who represents the uh, applicant. Um, unfortunately, we don't have Joel Bard here. I think he's up in a plane somewhere coming back from California. I did speak with him this afternoon, um, but we do have Mark Bobrowski here. And um, right. if we wanted to question him about this, he may have some in insight. Okay. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, six foot sidewalk versus eight foot sidewalk. I think it's legitimate for the planning board to ask the applicant to install an eight foot sidewalk if that's what you would like to see. Um, I think what the applicant was trying to do was match the existing town sidewalks um, at either end. But if you would prefer to have the eight foot sidewalk in here and less um, of the pavers, that could be accomplished. So you can make that recommendation or that suggestion. And then there's a parking thing as well, right? Oh, yeah. um, so I haven't seen any plans for um, that portion of East Pleasant Street, but this, the DPW is always making plans for different parts of town. And I know there have been comments that East Pleasant Street is very wide in that location. And it could be that um, DPW is thinking about putting parallel parking spaces on one side or the other. <clears throat> but I haven't seen those plans myself. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Maria and then Andrew. Oh, did you want to let um, Mark speak or no? The, the attorney? Oh, um, he, absolutely. Good point. Uh, he is here. Yeah, I think that if Mark you know, um, Mark can provide some depth if, uh, if that would be helpful. Um, I think that the letters that have been written have, have done that, but if, if you'd like Mark to opine, he could. Yes, I, I, that'd be very helpful, I believe. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I call your attention to the wording first of the bylaw, which is in section 9.22. The first sentence doesn't seem to be applicable here. It talks about non-conforming use of a building to be changed to a specified use. So it's more focused on uses. The second sentence says, said authority may also authorize under a special permit, non-conforming use of a building structure of, of a building structure or land to be extended or a non-conforming building to be structurally altered, enlarged or reconstructed provided the authority finds such in this case, reconstruction shall not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming use or the non-conforming buildings. So what the court is saying there specifically with regard to non-conforming buildings is that they can be quote, reconstructed. The whole question turns on the, the issue of what does reconstruction means. As I said in my memorandum, this was the focus of a case that uh, Judge Trombley had at the land court uh, back around 2000, 2001, and it made its way up to the appeals court. Neighbors on Nantucket claimed that a building could be reconstructed only if it was placed on its original footprint and not in any bigger area. Um, the court rejected that. And the quote that the court provided is that reconstruction simply means the act or process of rebuilding, recreating, or reorganizing something, citing Black's dictionary, there is nothing implicit, I'm still quoting the court, in the meaning of the term or its use in the bylaw that excludes reconstructing a structure at a different site. So as I said in chapter six of my book, and I'm, this often locks me into a position that I really can't change because it's available in the fourth edition, uh, this allows reconstruction of a building after voluntary demolition, not just after catastrophic demolition, and it's been used to great advantage back here in the capital of teardown 
which is basically every where around where I live in Concord, Lexington, and the communities um, around 128. Thank you, Mark. And, and uh, again, we're um, we're actually increasing uh, the setback from what the current setback is. Is yes, the, the, the court addressed that in the Glidden case. They were improving the setback. The neighbors argued that it, the building had to be uh, shrunk until it conformed, but the You're court right. rejected that argument and said that the building could be relocated. And because it was relocated in greater conformance, it met the test that you have in section 9.22. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Um, Marie, then Andrew, and then Janet, please. Uh, thanks for that, Mark. I was going to basically say that in my experience on working on residences in um, East Hampton, North Hampton, South Deerfield, all, uh, basically almost a town city around here, it's exactly that. It's um, If there's already a non-conforming structure um, in regard to setback, you can rebuild anything. You can add a whole story, you can enclose it, as long as you don't increase non-conformity. And this is my experience for residences. I haven't had it with um, commercial, but that's how all these towns have been interpreting that. And um, in fact, one town, I forget which one it was, was it was just, a, it wasn't a variance, it was just an administrative review. I just needed to show the original footprint and then show what the new project was going to be on that original footprint and it didn't even need to go to a planning board of any kind so um the the concept's the same um they just each town and sea has a diff different way of treating it um but that's exactly how i read it and how i've been using it in my sort of over a decade of working here is that um as long as you're not increasing the non-conformity you can you know add a whole another floor uh, change all of the exterior uh, and and I, I guess to that point also, as long as it's not more detrimental to the adjacent properties, but um, yeah, I haven't proposed anything like that, I hope so. Um, but thanks for that. That was very uh, good as far as sort of clarifying the, the sort of um, memos we got because uh, like, yeah, we're, most of us are not attorneys and uh, it just sort of went over our heads. But as far as just the use of it um, as an architect, I have definitely used it the way that was um, explain to us just now. No, you're welcome. It replaces a very unworkable case that was coin of the realm for years called Lomelis. I don't remember the town, but in that case, the court ruled that you had to leave one wall standing and the court actually ended with a fight between neighbors and the proponent when he says the wind blew the wall down and they said he pushed it over. So this is a whole lot better world. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Andrew and then Janet. Thanks, Jack. Um, so, Chris, I was curious about the, the eight foot, uh, if we did go to eight foot sidewalk, that would presumably add two feet to the east, not to the west, or could it be done, could that sidewalk replace a paved bridge? When you're on mute. Um, the, the sidewalk could replace part of the pavers. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that might be worth looking into. I. Because there's hardscape there in pavers, I think like it'll be still fine for path of travel, but I don't know, uh, just from an ADA perspective, it might be nicer to have the the, 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 the eight foot just may make it easier for, for two folks in wheelchairs to, to pass. Um, but I do like that idea. I think that a six foot is, is exceptionally narrow. Um, so I'd, I'd be supportive of, of uh, making that request. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Janet, please. So, um, I appreciate the information provided by Attorney Borowski, and, for his, and um, I know that he's an expert in this field. I also know we always seem to wind up talking about residential cases, which is not what we have here. Um, I think I'm trying to say sort of gracefully is I would like KP Law to present us with a, a memo, a legal opinion um, that presents that does the legal analysis that I had been looking for originally, and he and and presenting it, you know, representing the board and in our effort, not a particular client. Um, so, I mean, I could start talking about cases and language, and I, I just don't want to go there. I just I think we need our town attorney to 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 present to us clearly what the standards are, and please let's not talk about residential teardowns because that's not what we have. And we don't know if, I mean, has the nonconformity increased? 
Um, that's a factual question. Um, this this building, you know, so that's so we haven't done that analysis. Um, substantially more detrimental. We can discuss that. But let's start. Let's start off from an, a, a legal presentation from our attorney that I find comprehensible um, and easy to understand. Um, I don't. I just. I'm trying to be diplomatic and say I think that was a very poor presentation of information by KP Law. Um, I didn't appreciate it at the last minute. I didn't really, I had trouble piecing together two different emails and the cases. There are key cases in this area. We don't know what they are because no one's, you know, all of them, you don't have to go through every single one, but there is a way of establishing what the statute says, what the bylaw says, what the cases say, setting up a legal framework for analysis. And then we apply the facts of this case to those standards. And I don't think we have that yet. Um, and I think we need it from somebody who's not representing somebody, but representing us and our effort to figure out 9.22, which seems to be, I'm concerned that we're using it way too expansively. And, you know, we're basically going into the area of variances. It's very unclear to me when, you know, with a non-conforming building, you'd be going in front of the ZBA with a variance. And I, I think we need to understand that. And so I would like to ask KP Law to do a memo which is I think what we were asking weeks and weeks ago for. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I feel like there's a preponderance of, of uh, you know, information that, you know, again, beginning with Rob Mora uh, interpretation, KP Law has, has, has made this, you know, the, the, the reconstruction verbiage I think is significant, but um, we just had Mark uh, Bobrowski speak um, I don't know. Um, um, it seems like there's, the, you know, it's, it, we, there are waivers that we, that we can allow. And I think, you know, the eye test back, you know, viewing from the cemetery, we've done the rendering back there. Um, we know how it's going to, you know, improve in terms of getting rid of the buildings there that, and, 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 and all the trash and all that. That is that is there, but um, I'm pretty happy with the interpretations to date. To, you know, in my in my opinion, um, Maria, you, is your hand still up? Probably not. No, I, I did. I raised it while you were. Oh, okay. Um, I Yo, agree. So Maria, I don't please. feel like I need more. I'm sorry. I, I agree. I don't feel like I need more attorney research or information. I feel like I have the facts I need. Very good, thank you. Um, any other comment from the board? Jack, can I? Oh. Yes, what? Can we, can we just hold on one moment? I had gotten a um, message that Chris was having power issue, but I see her back now. Oh, okay. Chris, can you hear us okay? I can hear you. It seems that I wasn't completely plugged in. I'm very okay. sorry about that. I almost <laughs> okay. Connection. Okay. No, I'm plugged in. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Thank so you, I, I, Johanna, do you have your hand up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've been toggling back and forth. Sorry. I okay. Guess, um, you know, I think my reading also not a lawyer, but basically KP law says we as a board are empowered to make this decision. And I, I personally don't think we need to spend more town resources to get more clarity on that. Like that seems pretty clear to me. So I am kind of with Jack and Maria on that. Let's not send them down an expensive wild goose chase if we don't need to. Thank you. All right, well, we're at the point, uh, you know, we can uh, consider, you know, closing the hearing Someone wants to make that motion. Um, I know there are some, um, some you know, fine points that were that we could uh, discuss more. Um, again, you know, we're, we've been talking setbacks and front and and rear and, and side and all that, but. Um, feel like we we've, we've gone through this but again Janet you got your hand up so does this mean that we're 
we will close the hearing and then go on to discuss conditions like requiring 40% of retail, of, you know, commercial or business. Um, I mean, I don't understand what, where we are. Well, yeah. no, no one has made a motion. Uh, are, you, are you interested in other issues that people have? Are there, do you want to ask the board if they have any other questions or issues? Well, that's what I'm looking at. I don't see hands up. So that's, that's why I said that, because I didn't see a lot of uh, traction for further discussion. So, uh, Chris. I see Dorothy Pam's hand up in the um, public realm. Okay, we want, we want to grab her, okay. Dorothy? Hi, Dorothy. You can state your name and address, of course. 229 Amity Street, Amherst, uh, Dorothy Pam. Um, I just uh, want to make a, a brief comment, which is when a lawyer says it's up to the group, that means to me as a person of the public, not a lawyer, that it's not by right, it's not clear, and there's an area that you can decide, but I'm concerned about precedent. And this particular planning board might feel very happy with how they're working, but they should think about other planning boards, other members, and would they be happy with them having that total discretion and to say, oh, we have to do this, we have to do that. I mean, I just think, are we, the idea that because something existed and was non-conforming, you can knock it down and then put up something that's non-conforming in its place is kind of magical thinking. I'm not saying it's not illegal, but it's magical. Um, is that the kind of precedent you want? So that, that's just my comment there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Maria? Oh, I didn't know how to lower my hand. <laughs> but oh, um, uh, uh, do we normally go through find? Well, do we normally go through findings with, where we go through all the sections? Or I, I forget what the next step was. Do we do a motion first or do we go through findings? Maybe Chris. Yeah, Chris. <laughs> so I think it would be useful to go through findings and conditions before you close the public hearing, because then if you need new information, you can get the new information. If you close the public hearing, then you can't um, accept any new information. So um, Doug had his hand up. Yeah, I think uh, Chris has explained to me. I, I was one question I had after last week's meeting was whether, you know, closing the hearing means we simply don't hear from the public anymore, or whether we can't uh, obtain or create any additional analysis as we deliberate. So my understanding is that you can ask for clarifications on things, but you can't receive new information or new testimony. So my but, but could could I as a board member create new information that I then share with the board? No. Okay. Then I then I guess I would support going through the findings now. Okay. So um, either Chris or I could could do that, but I imagine Chris, you have a better handle on on the drafts. Are you yeah. okay with doing that, Chris? Um, sure. Do you want to go through the findings first, and then? Okay. We... Well, Jana's has got her hand up, but and and, um, and then we can do it, Jana. So I I would just I would like to see a better legal opinion from KP law or another attorney outside counsel. I don't want, and I, I appreciate Mr. Bobrowski's very short memo and you know argument in support of his client. I just don't know that we know enough about whether what's it, what, when you reach, go for a variance, when it's okay to you know do the 9.22 by special permit. We don't even know if this is increasing the nonconformity or not. I don't know what the cases hold, I, you know, and I, I actually, I just want to be very honest with you. This is, I'm a lawyer and I've been looking at this 
and I've been getting the email and I just don't, I don't think we've gotten good legal advice from our town council. I hate to say that. I, I don't think it's clear. I think it's clear that everybody thinks it's okay to proceed, um, but I don't think we have the information we need legally and also just in terms of what is the nonconformity and blowing up a building by 10 that might, that probably increases the nonconformity is just okay. Um, and, you know, I just, you know, I, I guess we can keep going on, but I do think it's, we don't, there's no particular rush. There's no reason why we can't get, you know, maybe we should ask an outside attorney. I know KP laws on retainer. I just don't want a bunch of late afternoon emails that don't really make that much sense to me. It's kind of like, hey, you know, here's, here's my thinking off the top of my head. I want to know what the law says. I, I would never hand this in to anybody, what we've received. Um, and I kind of like not to be ignored by my board members, you know, for my professional opinion. I, I find it kind of insulting. Yeah, but I think we talked about a scenario just leaving what all that awful building back there and actually reconstructing using that existing facade who would want that um and again we're a planning board that's, we're, not, what, that's not what the cases say so. <laughs> uh doug yeah i guess uh it seemed i guess uh, the legal cases aside um the level of whether we're increasing the nonconformity, uh, wouldn't that be something that between the planning staff and us, we could decide? And I guess, you know, I might start by asking Chris for her analysis of the existing nonconformity versus how this new building might nonconform. Chris? Um, so the existing building is um, about one foot, one and a half feet from the property line at one point, and it's about seven feet from the property line at another point. Um, so that's pretty close. This proposal is to have the entire building be 10 feet from the property line. So I do not view this as increasing the nonconformity. In order to increase the nonconformity, you would have to have part of the building be at least as close or closer than the existing buildings, which this is not. Um, so I think it's clearly not increasing the nonconformity. Rob Mora is here in the wings if you wanted to ask his opinion. He's the zoning enforcement officer for the town and um, he could probably be brought over as a panelist if he would agree to that. And, um, and yeah, yeah, if he, if he would, yeah, because I, I know he, you know, he was the kind of like the front line there in consideration of, of what would be reasonable. And I think he was okay with the five foot, you know, within the initial proposal. Yep. So Rob, if, if you are willing, uh, we'd love to bring you in and just kind of give your perspective on this. We could measure it. Yeah, yeah Jack, I, I'm here now, uh, Rob Moore, building commissioner. So yeah, and, and you know, I did make the recommendation to the applicant originally to uh, when I saw the original proposal at five feet uh, that they have this path to, uh, to make this application through 9.22. So that is where it all started. Uh, obviously since then they've, they've decided to increase that rear setback to 10 feet. Uh, but you know, we've used this over and over again. I've used it in other communities in similar ways. And I think KP law, you know, as, as uh, general and basic as the opinion or the information that was provided, uh, does what it was what it needed to do for tonight and establish that the path is there, uh, and that's what we were really you know looking to confirm with with Joel Bard is that uh, nine point two two can be used in this way, and I think he points out that our bylaw is even more generous than uh, than than state law, and that this isn't the only area that it does that. So our bylaw is very inclusive by use. So. It doesn't matter what's being proposed. My job is to find a place for it. Even if the bylaw doesn't specifically say that this can be done here uh, in a particular zoning district, I have to find a way for it to fit. And that's different from other bylaws that say if it's not specifically listed, it's prohibited. So it's just another way that our bylaw is consistent in being more generous and open to uh, these opportunities. So 
I do want to address, I know Janet has mentioned a couple of times, what's a, what's a variance? When is a variance used? Because we, we, we don't need it often in Amherst, uh, like, like we would, or we have in other communities that I've worked in and, and see all the time is that we have this 9.22. And if there's a non-conforming uh, situation that exists, um, that's when 9.22 works. If there wasn't a non-conformity that existed then the only option would be variance. So, um, you know, if if the setback was non-conforming but the lot coverage wasn't, they do not have the opportunity under 9.22 to vary the lot coverage above our minimum standard. That would require a variance. So everything that's being asked for here tonight with this application is either modifying, adjusting, reconstructing, however you wanna look at it, a non-conforming setback uh, which is what 9.22 was designed to do. Thank you, Rob. Janet? So my last attempt on this is just say we should accurately me measure the current non-conforming setback because it's it's not just one foot or seven feet. It's different at different points. But I, I sort of give up. <laughs> After that, I just think we should have at least a common set of facts to work off of. I would like to have a common set of legal standards and principles, but that at least we understand. Uh, Chris. We have a surveyed plan that's stamped by SVE Associates and they are surveyors and engineers. And that's what I use to measure the setbacks. So if someone could bring up that plan, that might be helpful in um, helping us to sort out what the existing setback is. It's one of it's one of the first SVE plans. Perhaps um, Kyle could bring that up. It's part of the civil set. There it is. Um, and if he zeroes in on the area at the back of the building, um, there's that one place that is towards the south. That's a little corner of the building jutting out um, near the property line. And um, that is about one and a half feet based on my measurement. I used a scale to measure that. And then further up um, where the other corner is, that's about seven and a half feet, I think. Um, so both of those points are closer than the 10 feet, which is currently being proposed. And this is a surveyed plan. And um, so I think we should believe it. I would, I would also add one East Pleasant is five feet back. What about the spots that are farther than seven feet and 10 feet on the back of the building? Those don't count. It's they just whatever is closest. Okay, um, thank you. So Chris, why don't, uh, why don't we um, go over your um, draft findings? Okay, um, these are findings that relate to the building project at 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street. And we're addressing the um, required findings under section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw. So I will read these slowly and um, pause after each one to see if anybody has any problems or questions. So the first one is 11.2400. The project is in conformance with all appropriate provisions of the zoning bylaw. The applicant has applied for a special permit to modify the side setback and height requirements under footnote A of table three and has applied for a special permit to allow a 10 foot setback rather than a 20 foot setback on the eastern side of the site under sections 6.141 and 9.22 of the zoning bylaw. Section, uh, next one is 11.2401. Town amenities and abutting properties will be protected through minimizing detrimental or offensive actions. The proposed use of the property is unlikely to create detrimental or offensive actions. Exterior lighting will be downcast and will not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. 
11.2402, abutting properties will be protected from detrimental site characteristics resulting from the proposed use. Again, lights will be downcast and or shielded. 11.2403, provision of adequate recreational facilities, open space and amenities has been addressed because the proposed project is located in downtown Amherst across the street from Kendrick Park, a public open space, and is adjacent to the West Cemetery and other public open space. The, the applicant is proposing to make site improvements to the public right of way in front of the property along East Pleasant Street, including tree plantings, seating, and a bicycle rack. And the applicant is proposing a generous landscaped area and a small sitting area to the south of the proposed building. 11.2410. Unique or important natural, historic, or scenic features will be protected. Although a line of existing trees will be removed as part of the building project, the historic West Cemetery, which lies to the east of the proposed building, will be protected with a relocated fence to be located along the property line and a row or rows of new trees planted along the property line with the cemetery. The Historical Commission has reviewed this project with respect to protecting the West Cemetery and has made recommendations, which have been forwarded to the planning board members. So we have a, a hand up. So yeah, everyone chime in uh, for, you know, this should be a discussion. Uh, I saw Janet and then Doug. So, I, I don't think that we ever, since I've been on the planning board, jumping back to um, provision of adequate, um, I've lost track, 11 point. 2403, provision of adequate recreational facilities, open space and amenities. So I, I've never seen us look to another park or another facility for this. And when you think of the word provision, you think you provide it. And so we have required on-site spaces for recreation. I know there is, I think there's a recreational spot inside this building, but I'm not quite sure. I remember that. I do think we need some more open space, like the Design Review Board has recommended more space for the plaza or combining that with the front plaza. Um, and then I think we could do, you know, seating or outdoor space um, in the, I can't, I, I'm always forgetting the name, the, the area for stormwater recharge or the holding area, that also could be a space. So I'd like to see those sort of discussed. I don't want to say Kendrick Park is nearby, so we don't have to do it. I don't, I think that's a bad precedent. Kyle, um, I, I, I don't recall what the amenities within the building are. Um, yeah, can we remember here? I think we should talk about those if we're gonna talk about it. May I just say something? Um, yes. For, for both um, Kendrick Place and for One East Pleasant Street, Kendrick Park was used as a, um, an available open space. And we're talking about dense um, downtown development and it's not very common to have um, green open space on properties in in the dense downtown development if especially if they are um, surrounded by which this in this case it is surrounded by um, publicly owned open space so the board has in the past talked about the fact that properties are across from Kendrick Park and that provides the open space that is talked about in 11.2403. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Doug, have your hand up. Yeah, I, I think uh, I would probably word this differently to, to say that and, and sort of key off of the word adequate. I think the fact that Kendrick Park and West Cemetery exist in the immediate proximity of the, of the project allows me at least to, uh, to feel that what is adequate is much less than a project that didn't have those amenities in the immediate vicinity. So I feel like what's been proposed is adequate, um, partly because yeah, it's a downtown, you know, apartment building and doesn't really, or mixed use building and doesn't really need a lot of open space. But, uh, you know, rather than sort of basing the uh, conclusion that everything is adequate off of those, I'd just say, because those exist, 
uh, we, we felt that the minimum adequacy was less than in a situation where they didn't exist. I would prefer just keying off what they're actually providing, which is, I think there's, there's an exercise room, there's a, probably two small plaza, um, and there could be, there's, there is green space on site that can be used. Um, I mean, I think you could talk about one East Pleasant Street and Kendrick Place, but I think that one of the problems with those buildings is those people have no green space, they have no place to go outside, and you can't wander around Amherst Parks all night, you know, you get thrown out. You can't have a beer in one, you know. So what am I going to do here? Um, reword this? To... I, would just I would just refer to what they're actually providing, you know, and we could say that's adequate, you know. That, that's my suggestion. So I don't know, you don't have to beat this home right now, I guess. I but. can put the, what Doug said and what Janet said together and um, come up with something. Okay. Not, not right now, but I will do that. And when I send out the decisions, um, people can write back to me and tell me if they agree with what I've said. Sounds fair, Chris, thank you. Okay. Um, do you want me to, to read? this are you how are you doing with your voice and i think i can get through this one and then okay. maybe can read the next one okay um, let's see um let's see oh we were on unique or an important natural features yes oh, 2410 unique or important natural historic or scenic features will be protected although a line of existing trees will be removed as part of the building project the historical west cemetery which lies to the east of the proposed building will be protected with a relocated fence to be located along the property line and a row or rows of new trees planted along the property line with the cemetery. The Historical Commission has reviewed this project with respect to protecting the West Cemetery and has made recommendations which have been forwarded to the planning board members. 11.2411, the project provides adequate methods of refuse disposal as described in the management plan. 11.2412, the project will be connected to town sewer and water. The town engineer has reviewed the proposed plans and has issued a letter of comment dated April 30th, 2021. A condition of the site plan review approval will, re will require that the project comply with the town engineer's comments and recommendations outlined in his letter. 11.2413, the proposed drainage system within and adjacent to the site will be adequate to handle the stormwater. The town engineer has reviewed the project and has issued a letter with comments and recommendations. Condition of the site plan review approval will require that the project comply with the town engineer's comments and recommendations outlined in his letter of April 30th, 2021. 11.2414, provision of adequate landscaping has been addressed. The project includes new plantings on site as well as proposed new plantings in the town right of way. 11.241. Do, do we feel that? Do we have like a landscape plan that we we think is adequate or will that come later? Because I think there's been a lot of discussion about the plantings and so whether, you know, this, that ties into the setback on the west side and the front and stuff like that. So is this just generic language and we can address I mean, I don't even feel like I have a landscape plan. Maybe I'm wrong. You did have it. You saw you were using it yesterday when we were at our site visit. So why doesn't Kyle bring up the landscape plan and the board so, can look at that? So, so are we accepting that landscape plan or can we address that later? Do you know what I'm saying? Um, why don't you address it now? Okay, so I just wondered if people, I, I didn't get the feeling, I didn't get the definite impression the board thought that that front space worked. And then, um, the idea of the set having trees along the west setback, uh, having a ten foot setback with trees and plantings, which I think actually is a requirement of the bylaw, when you have residential properties adjacent to non residential, there should be a vegetative buffer. So I didn't feel like those things were addressed. Um, but I don't know if we should. Do you know what I mean? Like, are we doing that here or later or? Well. That's one of the reasons for going through these criteria is to okay. <laughs> what you want to do. So why don't you talk about it now? I just did. I think, yeah. Uh, so. Janet, remember to raise your hand. Um, just uh, if you don't mind. 
Thank you. Uh, Tom, you have your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, um, the landscape plan as provided is sufficient and demonstrates what's happening at the street. It demonstrates clearly what's happening along the south facade all the way around to the west facade and the intent for those plantings to be also then negotiated with the town, um, uh, I guess, um, tree expert, resident tree expert, forgetting his name. Um, so, I mean, I think we've seen those things represented clearly in the last um, round of um, plan drawings as well as in the renderings and they've been updated. So I feel pretty confident that the, the plantings as presented are sufficient um, and, and, and do what they were intended to do. Thanks, Tom. Maria? I agree with Tom with the addition of maybe um, like a couple other board members suggested we increase the sidewalk by two feet to the west. But otherwise, yeah, I feel like the landscape plan was very sufficient. All right, thank you. Janet? You know, I think I misspoke. I meant um, a 10 foot setback on the north side and that would be where plantings would go, like trees, um, which I think is a requirement of the bylaw. And then also it would help break up the building which or soften the building in the words of the DRB. So that was, that's, I think I had the wrong direction for that. Can you point, uh, excuse me, may I raise my hand? Yes, Chris. <laughs> Janet, can you point to the exact location in the bylaw where it talks about um, the screening that's required? Between it, might, it might take me a little bit, but I just. Um, I'm looking for it and I'm. Um, I just, I, I just I read this. I remember seeing it, but I don't see it. Yeah, it's not, it's not on the top of my head. Well, but we've had a couple of members, uh, I think, in you know, general agreement with what's written here. So maybe we can just move on, Chris. Well, I also wanted to point out that section seven point nine of the um, of this of the section on parking, which is I think where this is. Um, talks about um, things that may be waived. So I'm not, if it's in the parking section, it can be waived. If it's elsewhere, we can look at that. If Janet can find out where exactly. Oh God, I'm sorry. I don't remember where it was designed. Maybe 7.1, two cars. Um, why not, why don't we move on and we'll search or and if we can't find it tonight, save it for another later, I guess. I'll, I'll look. Design okay. standards. 11.2415, the soil erosion control methods are considered adequate to control soil erosion both during and after construction. The town engineer has not expressed concerns about soil erosion. 11.2416. Adjacent properties will be protected by minimizing the intrusion of various nuisances. A construction logistics plan is required to be submitted prior to the issuance of a building permit. 11.2417, um, adjacent properties will be protected from the intrusion of lighting because a condition of the permit requires that exterior lighting be downcast and or shielded and not shine onto adjacent properties. 11.2418 is not applicable because the property is not located in a flood prone conservancy district. 11.2419 is not applicable because there are no wetlands on or within 100 feet of the property. 11.2420, the planning board did not choose to refer to the design principles and standards set forth in section 3.3040 and 3.2041 of the zoning bylaw because the project is within the jurisdiction of the design review board and the DRB has reviewed the project and has issued comments and recommendations. The development is reasonably consistent with respect to setbacks, placement of parking, landscaping and entrances and exits with surrounding buildings and development. The applicant has applied for a special permit to modify the side setback under footnote A of table three and has applied for a special permit to allow a 10 foot setback rather than a 20 foot setback on the eastern side of the site under sections 6.141 and 9.22 of the zoning bylaw. No parking is proposed on the site. 11.2422, 
Building sites shall avoid to the extent feasible the impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes, and wetlands. There are no steep slopes or floodplains on the site. There are no severe grade changes proposed. There are no wetlands on or near the property. There are no scenic views on the property, but the applicant has met with the Historical Commission to obtain recommendations as to how to minimize the impact of the project on the historic West Cemetery. 11.2423 is not applicable because there's only one building proposed for the site. 11.2424, screening has been provided as appropriate. All trash and maintenance equipment will be stored within the building and there's no loading area. 11.2430, the site has been designed to provide for the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement, both within the site and in relation to adjoining ways and properties. The access easement to the north of the property will remain open to allow unencumbered access to the adjacent bank and its drive up window. There will be no vehicles entering the site itself other than during construction. Pedestrian movement will be provided along the north side of the building via a five foot walkway along the south side of the building via a sidewalk that varies in width, and along the west side of the building via a sidewalk on private property, as well as proposed improvements in the public way. 11.2431, the location and number of curb cuts will be such as to minimize turning movements and hazardous exits and entrances. There will be only one curb cut, which will be on the adjacent property to the north, leading to an existing access easement. The curb cut will be a widened and improved version of the existing curb cut in that location. The other existing curb cut at the south side of the property will be eliminated and no vehicles will enter the site. 11.2432 is not applicable. There will be no parking spaces on the site. Tenant bicycle parking will be accommodated in the building. Public bicycle parking is proposed to be accommodated in front of the building in an improved area of the public way. There are no loading areas located on the site and access to the easement will remain open. So Chris, uh, let's do a pause here. Janet and then Doug and their hands up. I'm, I'm, so jumping back to, I was wondering if anyone on the board thought that the five foot walkway on the north side of the building with the bollards was sufficient. Cause I, I still think that's very tight. And I, I, I've seen people kind of I mean, it's tight, super tight on one East Pleasant Street, and it's not even the width of a crummy six-foot, you know, Amherst sidewalk. So I, I, I wonder if other people would agree with that. Um, and what's the width of the sidewalk on on the uh, on the south side too? I guess. Um, I think that's more like ten feet. Ten feet. Okay. All right. So. I see that as an alternative, but um, uh, we have Johanna, Doug, and then Andrew. Thanks. When I think about that north side, I, I think back to Maria's comments where we don't really, we don't know what's going to come next to the building. Um, it's kind of, it's still a little bit of an empty canvas. I mean, for now there's that easement and there's the bank, but I would be surprised if that's what it looks like 20 years from now. So, um, you know, I think the master plan inc would encourage us, I think, to do more dense development there. And so I'm, you know, I'm not wildly concerned about what that sidewalk or the setbacks look like, because I think it'll be the next project where that gets kind of, I don't know, looked at and, you know, like a vision for that northern part really starts to come to life. Yeah, so, so it's work in progress there. Uh, Doug and then Andrew. Yeah, I guess um, <clears throat> as long as that easement is there. I guess I'm okay with the five foot dimension. Um, and when the next project comes, I, I guess I have to assume that the, uh, the solution for the next project will keep any windows in the next project from being five feet away from the windows in this project so that, you know, the, uh, 
owner of this project doesn't have to sue the next project to have units that are rentable because otherwise you know you don't want to see somebody five feet away from you in the next window so um i guess that i kind of agree with johanna that that's all to be worked out later and as long as that easement is there we've got about 17 feet plus five feet so 22 feet of clearance um so chris or rob that has that easement the language there you know it's been checked out and confirmed you have the language it was presented to you um in a previous meeting um so we have we have the language and you're happy with it i di i didn't see a problem with it okay all right uh andrew did you have your hand up um, I, I put it down. I, I, I was comfortable with the five feet as well. I think that with the easement, I think we're, we're good. All right. Thank you. Uh, so, Chris. Um, we have a few more things, right? Yeah. Uh, so we were on 11.2432. I think we got finished with that. Um, 11.2433 provision. For access to adjoining properties is not an issue. The access easement on the adjacent property to the north will remain open. Um, there is also a little bit of a pedestrian access between 11 East Pleasant and, and 1 East Pleasant, if you wanted me to mention that. It's not handicapped accessible, but there is handicapped access if you go out onto the um, sidewalk and then back around. So I don't know if that's worth mentioning. Um, Chris. I'm sorry, I found it and I, I have a question about it. So um, these the screening of residential um, things, is, it's actually in um, the site plan review criteria and it says it's 11.2414. And it says provision of adequate landscaping, including the screening of adjacent residential uses, provision of street trees, blah, blah, blah. When a non-residential use adjoins a residential district, an uninter—oh, I actually think I'm getting it wrong. An un uninterrupted vegetative buffer shall, to the extent, be established and maintained between buildings associated with the uses. So, so this adjoining and non. This yeah, I'm wondering if that's. I, I think I read that as saying that all residential buildings should be screened, but I I think when non-residential adjoins a residential district. So this is considered- That would be on the, that would be on the property with the non-residential use, right? It wouldn't be on the residential use property. Is that right? Well, the mixed use building is considered um, a residential use. Okay. So this is a residential use. I think this is, puts the onus on a non-residential use. When I think so too, now that I'm reading it. It's a yeah. residential district. Then the non-residential use has to provide a buffer against the residential use. Okay, I think I see that too. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, 11.2416, adjacent properties will be protected by minimizing the intrusion of various nuisances. A oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm back on the other page. Nope. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, 11.2434. Um, not applicable. There's no new driveway proposed for this project. The existing access easement on the adjacent property to the north will remain open. Um, 11.2435 is not applicable. Joint access driveways between adjoining properties is not an issue since the adjacent property has an existing access easement which will remain open. 11.2436, the requirement for submittal of a traffic impact statement is requested to be waived and there is no traffic expected to enter the site. 11.2437 is not applicable because no traffic impact report will be required. Now the developer did present a traffic impact report um, during the first go round when he was expecting um, traffic to enter the site. So if you wanted to look back to that, you could do so, but um, that would probably be in your packets from, oh, I'm gonna say May 5th. But in this case, I don't think that's applicable because there won't be any traffic entering the site. 
So what do we think? Yeah. So Seems like you? on target there um, for the most part. Um, okay, so we had a problem with 11.2403 and I was gonna combine what Johanna said with what Doug said and create some uh, language to that effect. Okay, all right. So that is the findings for the site plan review for 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street. Now, um, Jack could read the findings for 15 East Pleasant Street, which is the construction project. Um, okay. Construction site, uh, access and storage. And do you have that in your packet, Jack? I do, I have it right here. It's a, like a half a page, correct? Um, yep. All right. Jack. Yes. Sorry, I just have my, um, sorry to cut you off, but the, um, did we get the, uh, the sidewalk width? I know I, I heard Maria mention it, but I'm not sure whether that was captured from six to eight feet. Where's, where's it 16 feet? No, from oh, six, six from six to eight. Oh, six to making, eight. Yes, we did. You did? Okay, we thanks. Did. Sorry, I lost track. All right. So Pam, help me out if there's any hands up here. Um, but this should be short. Um, so um, again, these are draft findings for Archipelago 15 East Pleasant Street. Um, the board found under Article 5, accessory uses, Section 5.00, General of the Zoning Bylaw, as follows. The site plan review application was filed under Section 5.00 of the Zoning Bylaw as an accessory use to the construction of a mixed-use building on the adjacent lot on, um, at 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street. The accessory use is found to be customary and incidental to the permitted principal use of a mixed use building and that it will provide a place for access to the site, temporary storage and lay down of construction equipment and materials and a location for a construction trailer and limited parking for contractors during the course of construction of the principal use. This accessory use is found to be located on a lot adjacent to that of the principal use in the same ownership. This accessory use is found to be not detrimental to the neighborhood or the property in the vicinity. The principal use that of a mixed use building is allowed by site plan review under article three, use regulations, section 3.325, mixed use buildings of the zoning bylaw. Therefore, the accessory use may be reviewed under a site plan review application. So there's that. And then there's a special permits one. Special permit um, findings, and I am not finding it in my packet. Maybe Pam could bring it up. Chris, which one are we looking for? Just for the special permits? We're looking for the special permit findings. Okay, here they are. Shall I go ahead and read them, Jack? Yeah, I, I have it up as well, but if you want to go, that's, that's fine. I could read half of them and you could read half of them. <laughs> okay. So for special permit number 2021-02, which is a request of a, for a special permit to modify dimensional requirements for height, side, and rear setback under footnote A of table three, section six of the zoning bylaw, the board found under Article six, table three, footnote A as follows. For height, that the new building is proposed to be 57 feet in height, that article six, table three, dimensional regulations limits the height of buildings in the general business district to 55 feet, that footnote A authorizes the special permit of granting authority to grant a special permit to modify the height requirement if it applies for the if it applies the criteria established in section 10.395 of the zoning bylaw and considers the proposed modified dimensional requirement in the context of the patterns of the same dimensions established by existing buildings and landscape features in the surrounding neighborhood, which have a functional or visual relationship to the proposed building. That the nearby buildings at 57 East Pleasant Street, which is Kendrick Place, which is 56 feet, 10 inches in height, and at 1 East Pleasant Street, 
which is 60 feet in height, both exceed the 55 foot height limitation in the dimensional regulations. That the design review board has reviewed the proposed building and has applied its standards and conditions in Article 3, Sections 3.2040 and 3.2041 of the Zoning Bylaw, 1 through 9, to evaluate the design of the proposed architecture and landscape alterations, and that the DRB has recommended approval of the proposed building. Can I, can I jump in? Hmm. I just, I never understand this, and I've, I've heard people say this over and over again. So the, the chair of the design re review board said this thing will, this building sticks out like a sore thumb. And so here's my question. Why are we only looking at the heights to the tallest buildings in the area? Because there's a lot of one-story buildings and two-story buildings. And so when I look at 10.395, it talks about not creating disharmony with respect to the terrain and to the use scale and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity, which have a functional or visual relationship to there too. And so we have the Greenfield Greenfield Savings Bank building, we have the Jones buildings, we have everything across the street. And so, you know, you may think that's harmonious, but I think we should also list their heights too and not pretend they don't exist. Um, and then there's the, but I think of the Petrucci's building, but it's gonna be a Mexican restaurant. So there's a lot of very low buildings nearby, the toy shop buildings, although they're a little bit high because they're high in the street. So I would, I would love to just put in the surrounding buildings, not just the tallest ones we can find. And I, I don't know if people would object to that, but I just think let's just be you know factually accurate about what's around us. So that's what, that would be my add to that. I, I, yeah. yeah, people have mentioned to this me over and over again. We're sort of cherry picking you know downtown and, and ignoring the whole the whole gestalt or something. So may I say something? Sure. So the. The zoning bylaw allows the height to be 55 feet in this area, and that does not necessarily comport with one and two story buildings that are around it. I think the intention is that this area be developed with taller buildings. So to you know, compare what's being proposed to a one or a two story building is you know, not really looking towards the future. So that's that's just all I have to say about that. But I will certainly list the heights of um, some of these smaller surrounding buildings if that's what the board like would like me to do. Well, it, it seems like we can get into Mucha, like there's, there, uh, there's parking lots, which, you know, and which it's not, you know, uh, I'm not sure it's adding value. No parking lot is creating harmony. <laughs> But yeah. I think just to be honest, what's there, you know, and if you feel like that's harmonious, then stand behind it, but not to, I think we should say those buildings are there. Okay. And that would be added to paragraph four. All right. Um, number six, that the proposed height of 57 feet does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain and to the use scale and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity which have functional or visual relationship with it. Okay. Okay. Um, you want me to go uh, further than that? Shall I read side setback also? I'll give you a little break. I'll do that. Okay. All right, uh, side setback, north side, that the new building setback from the Northern property line is proposed to be five feet. That article six, Table three dimensional regulations requires a side setback of 10 feet if a side setback is provided. That article six, section 6.132 states that in general business, BG, neighborhood business, BN and light industrial LI districts, minimum side yards shall be at least 20 feet when adjoining a residence district. Otherwise side yards are not required, but if provided shall be at least 10 feet that the side setback on the north side does not adjoin a residence district and therefore is uh, required to be either zero or 10 feet. That footnote A authorizes a special permitting grant authority to grant a special permit to modify the side setback requirement in the BG district if it applies uh, the criteria established in section 10.395 of the zoning bylaw and considers the proposed modified dimensional requirement in the context 
of the patterns of the same dimensions established by existing buildings and landscape features in the surrounding neighborhood, which have a functional or visual relationship to the proposed building. All right. Um, that the design review board has reviewed the proposed building and has applied its standards and conditions in Article 3, Sections 3.2040 and 3.2041 of the Zoning Bylaw 1 through 9 to evaluate the design of the proposed architecture and landscape alterations, and that the design review board has recommended approval of the proposed building. The side setbacks in the BG district vary. Some examples of side setbacks in the vicinity of the proposed buildings are 3337 East Pleasant Street, the spoke uh, has a size side, south side, uh, oh, this is a tongue twister. Okay, south side setback appears to overlap property line. 15 East Pleasant Street, the pub, former, um, north side setback appears to be four feet. 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street, the mercantile building, former, uh, has a north side setback, uh, appears to be six, oh, appears to be zero feet. 121 North Pleasant Street, which is a Unitarian Universalist Church. Uh, south side setback, original building appears to be seven feet. New section appears to have zero setback, north and south sides. 103 North Pleasant Street, uh, which is where Panda East is, and uh, Bart's and other things. Um, Peter Pocket, my favorite. Um, south side setback appears to be three feet. That the proposed setback of five feet does not create disharmony with respect to the train and to the use, scale, and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity, which have functional or visual relationships there too. Um, the request to modify the rear setback under footnote A has been replaced by the following request. You want me to read? Uh, shall I? Shall I read now? Okay. Okay. Special permit 2021-03, request a special permit for a non-conforming building to be structurally altered, enlarged, or reconstructed under section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw for a mixed use building proposed under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw. The board found under article nine, non-conforming lots, uses, and structures, section 9.22 as follows. That the existing building at 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street, formerly the mercantile Cousins Market and Airwaves is closer to the rear property line with the cemetery than allowed by the zoning bylaw. That the existing building at 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street abuts the rear property line at its closest point at one foot and seven feet closer than the allowed 20 feet. That section 6.141 of the zoning bylaw states that the general business district where the property is located, the minimum rear yard shall be at least 20 feet when adjoining a residence district. If the property at 11 and 13 East Pleasant abuts the general residence district RG at its eastern end and that the property that it abuts is the West Cemetery. That the existing building at 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street is one story tall. That the proposed building will be five stories tall. That the proposed building is proposed to be set back from the rear property line by 10 feet. Can you, um, can Pam scroll this up a bit? Thank you. Yep. That Sorry. the Historical Commission um, in its memo dated June 24th, 2021 expressed a strong preference for a minimum of a 10 foot setback and could support a 20 foot setback. That the Historical Commission recommended other work to ameliorate the impact of the new building on the West Cemetery, including relocation of the fence and new tree planting. That the alteration, enlargement, or reconstruction of the existing building at 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street, formerly the Mercantile Cousins Market and Airwaves, to create the proposed mixed use building is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non conforming building. Thank you, Chris. I think that does it for findings. Now we have conditions. Okay. We have two sets of conditions, one for the new building and the other one is for um, the, um, the site that's going to be the construction site. Yes. So do you wanna read some of the new building conditions, Jack? Well, I have, I have a fifth file. Um, 
and it says just possible draft conditions that you sent, uh, but it doesn't say, you know, location. Um, I'm wondering if it's. That's the one for 11 and um, 13 East Pleasant, but I think it's actually been superseded by a new list, which Rob Moore had yeah. to, um, this, the new list. Oh yeah, this, so that's 723. So that's old, that's old. No, that's actually new, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so from that, yeah, that's a good one. Oh, but except, wait a minute. This is a new one that was um, just reviewed by Nate Malloy at about 4.30 this afternoon. And he added a few things about affordable housing because Nate is our housing expert. So this is exactly the right list to read from. Thank you. Um, so I'm not sure I have the right version then. Um, well, but Jack, I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? Oh, okay. I'll just, okay. I'll, um, let me exam, uh, bump it up a little bit. So we have a document. This is a new document. I'm sorry. I'm confused. Yeah. So I don't think this has been emailed yet, right, Chris? You're on mute. This came in very late in the day. I asked Nate to take a look at the specific find as conditions related to affordable housing, and he's done that. Otherwise, everything is exactly the same as what you have in your uh, packet. So we can go through Nate's changes when we get to them because he's done them in track changes. Okay. Um, Andrew, you're good. Uh, I think the track change, yeah, I just wanted to see what had actually changed. Okay. All right, so these are the draft proposed conditions for 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street. Um, number one, development shall be built substantially in accordance with the plan submitted to the planning board and approved on. And uh, number two, development shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted to the planning board and approved on. Um, three, upon a change of ownership at the property is no longer managed by Archipelago Investments. LLC, the new owner and or manager shall submit a new management plan to the planning board at a public meeting for its review and approval. The purpose of the meeting shall be for the board to determine whether conditions of the permit are being complied with and whether any modification to the site plan review approval or management plan is required. So Janet, you have your hand up. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not, do we have a specific management plan other than the application report, like the original application? You received a management plan um, along I mean, with the application probably back, when would that have been? Um, it would have been in before the June 30th meeting. Oh, second. Okay. Before the June 2nd meeting, that's right. Um, so, that you might have received another one before the June 30th meeting. So it looks like we want to renumber these because I'm jumping from three to five here, but. Um, oh. Sorry. Yeah, so no problem. Uh, changes to the project and or substantial changes to any approved site plan or to the exterior of the building shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of this middle shall be for the planning board to approve the change and to determine whether the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require modification of the special permit or site plan or review approval. Jack. I would yes. like to I would like to point out that Kyle has raised Okay, his hand. Kyle. Uh, just a quick question on yeah, as it's listed 5. Um, the the determination, Chris, you can correct me if I'm wrong, of de minimis or non-de minimis precedes that um, through the building commissioner. The building change brings things to the planning board when he thinks that they need to be looked at by the planning board. If they're really insubstantial, then he can make changes, um, to, then he can approve changes. But um, he often brings what are considered to be relatively minor and could be construed to be de minimis by the planning board, but he gives the planning board the chance to make that determination. And I would only seek to define the first word in number five as 
changes because that could be a change in nail versus a change the color of the building. So is there a way to define changes so that it's not a change? Substantial changes to the project then, I guess, huh? Add the word substantial. Yeah. Uh, is Rob Morris still here? Um, yep. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't see any issue with that proposed change. The bylaw does allow for, uh, I, the bylaw calls it a minor change uh, as an administrative approval to a previously issued site plan. And that's usually, usually what I'm looking at first. And then this condition would uh, be reviewed for the board to dec decide whether or not the change was large enough to require modification of the permit or something they could just uh, review and approve or uh, reject in a public meeting setting. Andrew? Yeah, dumb question. I probably missed this earlier, but this is all in regards to like the 90 unit plan, right? Not the original yes. 50 odd units. Okay, thank you. Unit plan, yep. All right, so uh, number six, landscaping shall be installed oh, in accord. What? Oh, sorry, Jack, uh, just one more question. Um, our management, and uh, for this is for number three, our management entity is Amherst Innovative Living. Um, so maybe it says Archipelago Investments LLC or affiliates. So you, the board received um, the management plan on uh, for the June thirtieth meeting um, when you changed to your ninety unit building. So they do have the management plan, and if they still have their packets from June thirtieth, it's in there. But it's pretty much boilerplate. I'm just yeah, it's 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 insignificant, Chris. I, I probably don't need to bring it up. It's just a it's it's our management entity. Can you still Amherst. repeat a little bit again? Amherst Innovative Living, LLC. Would the board like me to put that um, name in this condition? Sounds uh, appropriate. There's a paper trail. Okay, I will do that. Okay. Okay, uh, number six, landscaping shall be installed in accordance with the landscape plan prior to the issuance of the certificates of occupancy. And once installed, shall be continually ma maintained. Um, all disturbed areas shall be loamed and seeded unless otherwise specified. Um, I think continually maintained kind of um, sounds like someone's gonna be out there <laughs> as needed, maybe maintained as needed. Um, I'm fine with it. Yeah, okay. All right, no mind. Um, seven, if the pending zoning bylaw amendment as amended with the publication date of 7 6 2021 and 7 14 2021 and referred by the town council on 7 28 21 regarding mixed use buildings is adopted unless the bylaw provisions do not apply in accordance with GL. Um, uh, chapter 48, Section 6, the applicant shall submit to the Planning Board a site plan review amendment application along with updated plans and document for review and approval of any changes necessary to satisfy the requirements of the new bylaw provisions prior to the issuance of, uh, of any building permit. So you know, strike the the there. So that's this is an interesting one. Uh, Doug or Chris yeah. first. Yeah, I uh, assume that we will, Chris could explain what this means and maybe I'm thinking of that uh, news she gave us at the last meeting about the submission of a subdivision application. Yes, Chris. So, so the board and, and CRC and town council are still working on zoning amendments and one of them is um, for mixed use buildings. And we have not, um, hit on final language yet. The board will be, um, the board had a public hearing and it will be deliberating and voting at some point in the future. And we don't know exactly what that is going to end up as. Um, so we're putting in this language because we're saying it's possible that this project may need to comply with that new zoning amendment that was advertised on these two dates. Um, on the other hand, 
the applicant has submitted a preliminary subdivision plan, which if he follows through and submits a definitive subdivision plan would give him um, protection from changes to the zoning bylaw. So um, the board has not heard anything about this preliminary subdivision plan yet. And you haven't held the public hearing or anything about that. So we don't really know how that's going to transpire or have an impact on this project. So we wanted to cover all of our bases and say, if the project has to change as a result of the mixed use building bylaw coming through, then the applicant needs to come back to the board to get approval for the changes. On the other hand, there may be a chance that he doesn't need to comply and that what he's showing on his plan is what he's going to be permitted to build and then he wouldn't need to come back. So that's what this is all about. And I- Janet? Janet? Sorry, this is off my very tired head. So this is a half acre lot. Is it possible, physically possible to have a subdivision and a a road around it? I mean, can you submit a subdivision plan on something that you actually can't ever build under the code? Is that just, or is that a question for another day? That's a question for another day, but there is um, another property included in the subdivision. So it's not just the property that's um, being considered for the building. It's also the property that is directly to the north of it. And there may be something else involved as well, but. Um, okay, I'm just wondering, okay. So what's the drop dead date for bylaws being, uh, you know, approved subsequent to the, uh, you know, initial, you know, be, uh, beginning of the hearing? Is it, is it the building permit sort of, or? No, it really has to do with the publication date of the, um, of the zoning amendment. When the zoning amendment uh, public hearing, the planning board public hearing for the zoning amendment is advertised, that's the date when um, the applicant needs to comply with the new zoning amendment, if it were to be adopted. And um, we don't know if it's going to be adopted, and we don't know if it's going to be adopted in exactly the form that you saw it at the public hearing. Um, mm -hmm. So this, this condition is trying to embrace all of the possibilities. Um, but if the applicant is going to be required to uh, comply with a mixed use building standard that is different from what he's showing on his plan, then we want him to come back and show it to you and get approved for it. All right, Kyle. Uh, just quickly, I think the one thing that is left out is if this project uh, meets that zoning bylaw amendment. Um, That's correct. Yep. Right. So I think I would, if, if we could have language in there that says, if that's the case, then, then it meets the zoning bylaw amendment and we obviously wouldn't have to come back before the planning board. Okay. And what number is this? This is number that's seven. Seven. Okay. We can put such language in. Yep. Please. Thank you. Um, so we're on number eight. Um, the building shall meet all required energy efficiency codes and the regulations of the stretch energy code. In addition, low flow pumping fixtures shall be installed throughout the project. Uh, next, the site plan review approval shall expire within two years of the date that is filed with the town clerk unless it has been both recorded that the registry of deeds and substantial construction or use has commenced within the two year time period. Number 10, construction shall be completed within 24 months from the date of issuance of the building permit. If more time is needed, the applicant shall come before the planning board at a public meeting for a review and approval of an extension of time. Jack, I want, yes. to, point, I want oh, to point out Doug and Kyle both have their hands raised. Okay, Doug. Yeah, I was curious whether the stretch energy code applies to this project, uh, I, I guess I, I thought that that was for projects uh, permitted as a residential under the residential state code, um, and if this is permitted under the commercial code, I'm not sure it applies. That would be a question for Rob Mora. Is he still here? 
Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, Doug, the the uh, stretch energy code does uh, apply to these buildings uh, for the residential units and are uh, subject to the performance testing and HERS rating and all that comes along with the uh, stretch energy code. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Kyle? Uh, I'd like to request 30 months instead of 24 months on number 10, please. Any Would allow us to handle winters on either end a bit better. Does the board, does the board agree with that? Yeah, I, I don't see any uh, objections. Andrew, Janet, Andrew? I, I, I'm supportive of that. Okay. Thank you. Janet? So I've only seen 24 months. And so they're saying is that you have to um, substantial, you know, it's like you have to really get into the project. And so I don't, I've seen that over and over and over again in Amherst. And it seems like there has to be a reason for that. Um, so the 24 months usually relates to how long the site plan review or the special permit is good for unless yeah. you start construction. But if you start construction, normally we don't put a limit on how long construction can take. Um, for some reason, we have recently decided it's a good idea to put that limitation on so we don't have projects that go on and on forever. So um, that's what this is about. But usually the 24 months relates to how long you have for your site plan review or your special permit before you start construction. So, so there is, so the reason for the 24 minutes completion is making sure it gets done. Is that, is that what you're saying? That's right. Okay. So uh, project use residential, the total number of dwelling units shall, uh, to be constructed, the project shall be limited to a maximum of 90 units, 30 studios, 36 one bedrooms and 24 two bedrooms. Uh, the building shall not exceed a maximum of, oh, are those residual hands up or? Oh, sorry, yes, sorry. And Andrew? M mine wasn't, I'm just, I'm trying to remember whether it mentions the affordable units elsewhere in here, and if not, should we have yeah. it in, in line 11? Yes, it does. It does further down? Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, the building shall not exceed a maximum of five stories and a total of 57 feet measured from average finished grade on the street side of the building to the highest point of the flat roof, excluding any, uh, how do you say that word? Parapet? Parapet. Parapet, uh, or other rooftop equipment as outlined in section 6.17 of the zoning bylaw. Uh, 13, the principal use uh, shall remain mixed use building and shall not be changed to any other residential use, including private dormitory. 14, the property shall not be used for temporary, no less than 12 months, short-term housing, short-term lodging, or advertise as such in print or electronically. Um, apartments shall meet all applicable AAB, A, the ADA requirements within, with 5% of the total units being fully accessible and all units uh, visitable. I don't know if you want to scooch up. Scroll down, Pam. I will, yes. Do we want to, I'm sorry to check, you mind if I, do we want to require that the accessible units be on the first floor? Because that was a point. Yes. Um, or that the first floor units be accessible. I don't know if they. I, I don't think that's, um, is that? I think that the units that are designed on the first floor now are primarily studios. And I think there might be one two bedroom unit at the far end. So I don't know if that's a reasonable thing to request because um, there may be other more luxurious apartments up above that would be suitable for um, ADA units. I just thought the whole point was that people who are with disabilities prefer the first floor or people using wheelchairs. So it, it seems like it should be good that those units can provide them with units on the first floor. <laughs> the building would need to be, excuse me. I'm sorry, I should gonna raise my hand. Yes, Chris. The building would need to be reconfigured in order to accommodate that. So I don't know if that's something that you wanna require now. We have heard that people with disabilities prefer to live on the first floor, but there is an elevator in the building to provide access to other units. 
I'm going to jump to Kyle and then Andrew and Doug. Uh, thank you. Relative to the apartments on the first floor, there's six apartments. There's 11 affordable units. Our intent was not to make those six all affordable. The intent was to, as we'll discuss later on in this, you know, spread those out uh, throughout the building. Um, as it relates to the uh, number 15, um, the 5% of total units being fully accessible and all units visitable, those are building code requirements. I'd prefer if the building code ran it rather than a condition. If the building code, um, and that may be fine and I would defer to Rob more on that, but I, I wouldn't want a condition and a building code to conflict on something like that. Um, and the last was number 13, um, the language that says including a private dormitory. I think a private dormitory is defined in our bylaw and I don't think there's any opportunity for this to be one. So I don't think that needs to be required or included. Okay, um, Andrew and then Doug, Oops. and then Thanks. Chris. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I, I, I wonder if there is some, what if, if, if 15 said like including, um, or it just had some reference to some units on the ground floor. I, I know there's varying degrees of disability and for some folks, they may not necessarily care what floor they're on, but we did hear it. I think it would be I think it would be worthwhile to put in here to say that you know at least some of them are on the ground floor. I uh, so that that's that's kind of piling on what Jan was saying. I was also and again if this is in here later as well, um, would um, any of the fully accessible units be part of the? Um, uh, oh my gosh, too late. The um, the the affordable housing. Sorry, it may be. Yeah. It may. I mean, right now it could or couldn't be, right? It could could be or it couldn't be. It depends yeah. on who needs the units. So I guess at the same right. same side. This is this is just a question for the, the board. Is would we want something in here that would indicate that uh, there needs to be at least one unit uh, that is both affordable and fully accessible? And that number could be whatever, just a thought. So Chris, your, your hand's up. Um. What was my hand up for? Oh, my hand was up about um, having units on the ground floor. I really feel like that's, maybe we should add words. If you wanna put that in, you should say if feasible or as, as much as possible or something like that. But I feel like it's gonna be hard to um, do that in the current, uh, with the current floor plan. Uh, Maybe Rob yeah. has some language that he could offer that might make sense. Uh, we can defer to Rob and then, and then Doug and, and Janet. Rob, do you have any comment on that wording? Uh, I get, my only comment is that the, um, the building code doesn't really prescribe that they have to be on a particular floor. Ideally, we would like to see them uh, offered in various locations throughout the building, uh, just like the affordable units will be spread out. Uh, I don't know the floor plan of the first floor uh, layout well enough to say that uh, it could easily be accommodated. So I think that question would have to go to Kyle if they could offer a unit on the first floor as a fully accessible unit. Okay, Doug and then Janet. Yeah, all I was going to say was typically or, or often some of the accessibility codes require that the accommodations be distributed through the space or through the building. So, you know, language like that might be consistent with some of the other codes. Um, but, you know, if, if Kyle says it's not a, a hardship to specify that at least one such unit is going to be on the first floor, then I'm, I have no objection to adding that. Okay. Um, Chris, is your hand up or? 
Yeah, it had to do with okay. um, requiring that one of the affordable units be accessible. And I think that's another question for, I don't know if Nate Malloy is still here. Let's see, is Nate here? Nate is not still here. Um, okay. That may be a question for Rob. Is that a reasonable thing to require or should they be um, distributed as, as to the need? Well, I think it's reasonable to um, to require it if the you know if the need is there. I guess you know what I'm guessing Nate would say is that you know there comes a time where the the building operator has to fill the unit, and that uh, you know depending on what the need is, we'll have we'll address whether or not it's an accessible unit. But we have heard, um, I think, recently through the um, uh, Disability Commission conversations about how. Uh, affordable units have not been found to be accessible in uh, in the various apartment complexes. And talking through that with Nate and others, you know, we we felt like this is the place to deal with that uh, on a permit condition by the board, not in the bylaw. So I think it's you know it certainly is a, a valid uh, request if the board thought it was uh, appropriate. To require that one of the units that's affordable also be accessible? Offered as accessible, uh, but maybe not strict language that there isn't an alternative uh, if there, all the affordable units are otherwise filled uh, you know, without a request for an accessible unit. Maybe we could work on that language. Okay, thank you, Janet. So I think that there's a, a lot was made of the fact that people um, in wheelchairs or have um, other um, accessibility issues really like to be on the first floor. And now we're whittling it down to one unit on the first floor. So I, I find that a little hard to take, partly because my parents were both are both handicapped. And so it seems like it seems almost like you're using that as a justification for something you wanted. So I, I'd like to see an effort towards universal design. If somebody's blind, or you know, in a in a wheelchair, and they're going to feel more comfortable on the first floor, I think they'd like to have more than one possible unit. And so, I you know, I think we should move towards inclusiveness and the needs of of people with disabilities, and not just rhetorically. I find that a little much. So, if it's, I'd like to see more than one unit on the first floor that's accessible or universal design, so some people will feel safer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not totally aware of the, the first floor. I mean, with the elevators being present, like, like Chris said, that, that does up went up the whole, you know, building uh, to accessibility, but um, do Tom. You want, do you want to look at a first floor plan? I mean, my, yeah. my, my reading of the way in which accessibility is, is treated and, and should be treated is yes, I think we do want to accommodate the first floor, but I think as uh, Doug noted, the distribution is actually an important part of that, that um, being relegated to a specific place is also not um, um, equal, right? Uh, maybe people want a view from the third floor or the fourth floor and um, also have um, specific ADA needs. So I think allowing for distribution throughout the building um, in whatever capacity, as, as Doug noted, um, is valuable, whether we want to mandate one on the first floor, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, but I'd, I'd rather be more inclusive in the sense that um, people have the option um, to, um, to make a choice about where they want to be in the building and not be relegated to a specific place. Good comment, Tom. Um, did oh, uh, Kyle, and then maybe Rob. Uh, sure. So the next two pages all go over all the requirements of how you place units and and um, what type of units and the number of units that need to be studio, the number that need to be one, the number that need to be two. Obviously, on the ground floor, we only have a certain type of unit. We have no problem putting. Uh, 
an affordable unit on the ground floor. Um, this building will be, you know, the Massachusetts AAB requirements uh, mandate uh, a number of these 90 apartments to be fully accessible. Uh, I have no problem allocating as many of those as we can, the, as the puzzle allows, trying to accommodate these to be affordable. I have, we have no problem doing that if that works. So um, there are a lot of different things to juggle in terms of building code, in terms of affordable requirements, in terms of accessibility requirements. So I would just ask for, we're open to put things on, put affordable units on the ground floor. I just ask for some flexibility so we don't get caught between three, you know, one of the different five different criteria we're trying to meet. Thank you, Rob. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to read the code language uh, really quickly here because there is a distribution requirement that uh, both Doug and Tom mentioned and it's, it reads that the units shall be proportionally distributed across the total number of units according to the number of bedrooms, size, quality, price, and location. So when it does get down to the time when we're reviewing the final layout and uh, you know, we'll talk later about the affordable units and we do ask for a, a very specific plan and locating those affordable units, we'll be doing the same for the accessible units. So I think the condition as it reads, you know, adding the language that including uh, at least one unit on the first floor would probably work well with what we'll have to do to ensure that they are uh, spread out appropriately to meet the code. Thank you. Um, so, Chris? So are we talking about at least one affordable unit or at least one handicapped accessible unit on the first floor? or one of each? I believe the discussion was about accessibility. Yeah. Accessible unit. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Kyle? I, I was going to ask the same. Is this for an affordable unit on the ground floor or an accessible unit on the ground floor or an affordable and an accessible unit on the ground floor? Chris? Oh, I, that was my question. So you've answered it, that it's for yeah. an accessible unit. On yeah. the ground floor. Doug? Can I, can I interject that I believe we were talking about Article 15, which is concerning accessibility. We have not gotten to the ones, to the articles about affordability yet. Yeah. So that would be accessible. Okay, I get it. Yep. So this is about adding some language on Article 15. On sentence 15, which has to do with apartments shall be all access applicable, fully accessible, including one unit on the first floor. Okay. That's right. Okay, so uh, I'm just saying the units of the project shall be registered and permitted in accordance with the Amherst Residential Rental Property Bylaw. Loss or suspension of a rental permit shall con constitute a violation of this condition. Uh, project use, commercial, retail, non-residential tenant space spaces. Any use authorized in the commercial, retail, non-residential tenant space at this project site shall be you shall be uses allowed by right or permit permitted by the site plan or by special permit in the general business BG zoning district. Marketing and lease agreement. Lease shall be a minimum duration of 12 months. Uh, 19, uh, Andrew? Is that residential leases? Not commercial leases, I, I'm presuming. Um, 18, yes. I assume that's residential leases? I think, it's, I think it's supposed to be residential leases, so I should add that word. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Janet. So one a condition I would add is it cannot, you know, apartments cannot be released leased room by room. Um, so I would add that, but I wonder if we can. Um, we all seem exhausted and kind of stumbling, and I see pages and pages. Is there a way we can just continue this till next week and? 
fit you in early. I'd be happy to meet at six just to um, finish this up, but I'm, I'm completely exhausted and it seems like we're going slower and slower and stumbling a bit. Or, I, I'm, you know, we're at, we're at hour four. Yeah, what's on our, what do we got on the docket for? Uh, you have um, eight, Greenfield, oh, August. Greenfield Savings Bank. Um, that's a continuation of the public hearing. You have um, a new project at Bay Road. It's a parking lot for a trailhead for Sweet Ellis Brook Trail. Yeah. Um, a, um, uh, the continuation of the public hearing about the rezoning of the lot behind CVS. So you could conceivably continue this to, um, to that date. And it would be just to, for the purposes of going over the conditions and um, voting, is that correct? Yes, uh, Doug? We have not closed the public hearings, right? Right. So you'd have to continue the public hearing to that date. Does that require advertising or? No, um, no. but you know what I wanted to say that um, there aren't that many more conditions yeah. left because I was going to suggest that we not go through the construction um, conditions because we've already done that a million times and, and I think people find it tedious and they all say the same thing. So um, the, the construction conditions are sort of boilerplate, but it's up to you as to whether you want to um, continue this to next week. Okay, uh, Kyle. And I would also say that the great number of these are affordable units that are, you know, Nate Malloy worked in because he's the affordable professional. And so I, I don't imagine that we're gonna be editing elements that Nate put on when he's not on because they're, so I would, I would absolutely uh, ask if, if we could finish this tonight, I would greatly appreciate that. You wanna take uh, a vote, Jack? Uh, I got Maria. Maria, how are you doing out there? <laughs> My goodness. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you guys talk about tired. You don't know tired. Um, I was hoping we could wrap up tonight because I'm not positive I can make the next meeting. I will be in transit. And I said to Chris, I could probably call in, but I would have to call in late. And I'm not sure when you would be voting. I definitely didn't want to miss it. So if we can just push through, uh, what number are we on? 18? And there's how many? There, oh my God, there's 40, 50. Oh, we're not going to 55. So we'd be stopping at we stopping at four. Is that what you were saying? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm fine to keep going. I'll let the other board members chime in, but I was, I've was i had so much coffee, I can keep going. So you guys decide, but I can keep going. All right, Andrew. I I'm okay going. Although, as I say that, I, I just um, respond or think about Janet's comment. I was going to say number 18, how I'd said residential. As I read it again, maybe we, we actually don't include that residential language uh, as a, a go back because I think um, they would probably make sense to have 12 months beyond for, for residential and commercial. Um, however, if, if we feel like there is a uh, a need to be able to do pop-ups, then, then maybe we do keep it as residential. But in any situation, I'm, I would love to, to power through as well because I may have limited availability at the next meeting also. So, okay. Do you want me to pick up reading, Jack? Uh, I'm good. So we're, we're on 19? 19. Yeah. Any substantial modifications to the lease agreement which may impact tenant oversight as determined by the building commissioner, specifically excluding minor updates such as pricing date modifications, clerical errors, or language updates required by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or other government entity shall require the applicant to return to the planning board at a public meeting. Okay, so now on to affordable units. Chris, is your hand up? No. Okay. Affordable units, at least 12% of the dwelling units, which would be 11 units, shall be and remain affordable and shall be marketed. Whoops. Um, Sorry. 
uh, should be marketed to eligible households whose annual income may not exceed 80% of the area median income adjusted for household size as determined by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, the affordable units, and it, subject to approval by DHCD, the affordable units and the remaining units shall be eligible to be included in the town's subsidized housing inventory as main, pay, maintained by DHCD. Additionally, in accordance with Article 15, inclusionary zoning, uh, the zoning bylaw, most 20% uh, of the affordable units, uh, two shall be affordable in, per, uh, in perpetuity to households earning 60% of the AMI or less. As defined by Article 12 divisions or definitions of the zoning bylaw, affordable housing units are units which may only be rented or purchased by families or households whose annual incomes adjusted for family size do not exceed the limits for the maximum annual income for low-income families or households. 80% of the median income for Amherst as calculated by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development or any, uh, uh, or any successor agency and are eligible and accountable for the purpose of the Commonwealth's 40B subsidized housing inventory or its successor. With a total of 90 units proposed, a total of 11 units shall be affordable units as defined by Article 12, definitions of the zoning bylaw. These affordable units shall include three studios at 80% AMI, one studio at 60% AMI, one bedroom at 80% AMI, one bedroom at 60% AMI, and three, bedroom, three two bedrooms at 80% AMI as listed in the management plan. If the total number of units changes, the applicant shall require, shall be required to return to the planning board for review and approval of the change, including uh, in the chains, including, oh, how's that say? Um, including in the change in the number of uh, affordable units. There's something um, wrong with that sentence, I think, um, including in the number of affordable units. If the total number of units changes, the applicant will be required to return to the planning board for review and approval of the change, including a change in the number of affordable units. So in the okay. change to A. Okay. Um, affordable units and ADA units shall not be segregated from the market rate units. And in accordance with article 15, inclusionary zoning of the zoning bylaw, the affordable units shall be dispersed throughout the development and shall be comparable to the market rate units in terms of quality design materials and general appearance of the architecture and landscape. So there's there's the, the statement that we were uh, prematurely addressing earlier. Um, 23, is there a 24? Can you scroll up, Pam? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not that far. Okay. Yeah. Are we on 23 or 24? 24, 24. Okay, there's 24 right okay. there. The applicant shall submit a local action unit application to the DHCD under the local initiative program into a, into a, reg, a rental regulatory agreement with the DHCD and the town and comply with all DHCD requirements. So as to ensure that affordable units will be included in the DHCD subsidized housing inventory for the town. The uh, 25, the affordable units are to remain affordable in perpetuity, subject to the DHCD approval. This requirement shall be included in the regulatory agreement. The affordability requirement shall remain in effect in perpetuity, even if the requirement is not included in the regulatory agreement or if the regulatory agreement is terminated. Uh, 26. Affordable units shall be marketed and rented to income eligible households in accordance with the DHCD regulations and guidelines for the local initiative program uh, guidelines, which require the approval by DHCD of an affirmative, affirmative fair housing marketing plan. The costs associated with the development and implementation of the marketing plan, including advertising and processing for the affordable units shall be borne by the applicant. Subject to the approval of DHCD, a qualified agent shall be engaged by the applicant to administer their initial marketing and lottery for the affordable units and to maintain a waiting list for subsequent rentals in compliance with the income eligible el eligibility requirements for tenants uh, of the affordable units. Number 28, you wanna move that up a little bit, Pam? Yeah, I will. 
um, as allowed under application law um, and for no more than 70% of the affordable units, the applicant shall provide a local preference category for those eligible for local preference who in the initial lease, in the initial lease up, uh, lives in the community, is a municipal employee, works at a business in the community, or has children in the schools of the community, or other category of local preferences as defined by the state agency providing financing. 29, the affordable units shall be identified and exhibit to the DHCD uh, regulatory agreement thereafter. If an affordable unit ceases to account, ceases to count as a, an affordable unit due to increases in tenant income, pursuant to DHCD regulations and the provisions of the regulatory agreement, the next available market rate unit with the same number of bedrooms as the affordable unit in question shall be rented as an affordable unit. The regulatory, uh, Kyle. Yeah, quick question on the 70% in 28. Has that been used elsewhere in Amherst, that number? Yes. Okay. It's only for the first lease up. Thank you. Okay. Um, the regulatory agreement, uh, number 30, the regulatory agreement shall be approved by the DHCD and recorded at Hampshire County Registry of Deeds prior to the issuance of any certificate of occupancy with a copy provided to the building commissioner. The affordable units shall be designated and shown on a floor plan provided to the planning department prior to the issuance of any building permit. 32, the affordable units shall be available and the tenant selection process shall be in in process at the time of any full or partial certificate of occupancy for completed units. However, at the discretion of the building commissioner, a certificate of, certificate of occupancy may be issued and exclude the affordable units until the tenant selection process has been completed and inspection services has been um, provided, has been, <clears throat> excuse me, and inspection services has been provided documentation of the completed selection process. Sorry about that. Uh, the affordable units shall be occupied at all times only by qualifying tenants in accordance with the regulatory agreement. So this next section, is that construction? We should probably go through that next section. Do you want me to okay. read it? Sure. Okay, so number 33, outdoor bicycle storage shall be incorporated into the site improvements that the applicant propose, proposes in the town right of way. Indoor bicycle storage shall be located inside the building in the room labeled bike as shown in the submitted plan of the first floor. The town engineer and building commissioner shall inspect the construction of the entry driveway and all on-site paved areas for conformance to the town standards. All on-site utilities shall be underground. All exterior lighting shall be dark sky compliant. Exterior lighting shall be downcast, shielded, and shall not shine in onto adjacent properties or streets. And I think, let's see, from here, let's see. I think that these are mostly related to construction. So I think we can dispense with these. I assume that everybody has read it or read something similar in the past and is fine with them. Do you wanna just sort of skim through them? Yeah, I'm skimming. Yep. Okay. Can I, can I jump in here? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm con I'm remembering um, Pam Rooney's comments about um, safety for people walking along Prey Street, and that she wanted to have construction vehicles enter and um, enter and leave the site on from East Pre East Pleasant Street, not P Prey Street, since there's people walking along there. And then she also asked for like, I guess a temporary pedestrian crossings marked from the Jones buildings to the north side of Prey Street. So people would be, you know, say walking along the Jones buildings, get the direction right south, and then they'll hit the construction site at 15 East Pleasant. So they have a crosswalk to go, you know, kind of where they normally wouldn't go towards the bank and, and escape. And I wonder if anyone had an objection to that because both of those seem sort of sensible to me. Kyle? Uh, I think we've discussed these in the past. I think that our intent is to make sure that the bank tenant has as much accessibility as they possibly can. So we wanna be very conscious of that. So that's why we've done the uh, construction plan that shows coming in from 
Prey Street and using that spur after you come across the, the sidewalk there and get into Prey Street to um, manage uh, the construction uh, coming and going from the site. So we'd obviously prefer to not put additional load on, on the bank and try to keep that on Prey Street. We are willing to, you know, accommodate if, if there's the need for a uh, temporary cross on Prey Street there, which I don't think there would be, but if there was, uh, we'd obviously be willing to work with the town on that. So may I say something that um, the town is working on a project, we could just got mass DOT financing to um, enhance the sidewalk and the crosswalks on the north side of Prey Street. So we're hoping that most people will walk along the north side of Prey Street to get to East Pleasant Street. Um, so we're going to be showing that plan to the town council on Monday. Will, will that happen in time for this construction project? Do you think? Yes, I believe it will. It'll happen this fall. Uh, All right, we have Maria, Andrew, and then Doug. Uh, thanks. I think for either number 46 or 48, um, it doesn't need to be written, but just to remember that we wanted to widen the sidewalk so that whatever the approved plan is or or shown plan to town council incorporates that widened two foot sidewalk in the right of way. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I, I don't think wording needs to be added, but just if, um, if Kyle can alert his uh, landscape architect. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Um, Andrew? Yeah, I, I think Janet, were you saying just like to have essentially a painted crosswalk across Prey Street just to make that more visible to folks walking by the Jones buildings? Jan, Janet? Janet? I, I agree. I agree. Oh, all right. No, I just want to make, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, well, just I, I, I fall asleep. <laughs> that's right. Just, I mean, to paint a crosswalk over Prey, that's got to be pretty easy to do, whether that's something that the town does or Kyle does. So I think what Kyle's saying is he doesn't want to put construction traffic over the easement, which is off of East Pleasant Street. Or I want to limit that as much as I can to reduce the impact on the bank. Yeah, maybe we're thinking, maybe I'm thinking of the wrong spot. I, I thought you were suggesting, Janet, that it would be sort of Prey Street, the old laundromat over towards like yeah. the spoke. Yeah, yes. so on, on Prey Street wouldn't yeah. impact the, the easement at the bank. It would pull folks away from that and should make it easier for the bank to operate. I have no problem painting a crosswalk if if uh, DPW wants us to. That's fine. Okay, uh, Doug. Yeah, I was I was going to say I, I kind of would defer to Rob Mora and the DPW in their review of the construction plan. For, for all of these kinds of things. Um, you know, I, I would imagine there's more pedestrian traffic on East Pleasant Street than there is on Prey Street. So getting the construction traffic off of East Pleasant Street might actually be more beneficial to more pedestrians. But That's as I said, I would, I would uh, defer to Rob on this. I agree. All right, any any more on these conditions? Yeah. That's what I was gonna ask. Okay, so we can move on to conditions for uh, Chris. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I have one. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh 51, the management plan, Chris. Uh, I'm addressing Chris, but the board, all snow plowed within the project area shall be promptly removed from the site as part of the clearing process. Um, uh, I think that, you know, there'll be, there will be snow banks at some point in the winter. We're not going to just go and pick up all the snow on the site and take it off. So I don't want to imply that I'm going to be picking up snow off the site, vacuuming it up and taking it somewhere. Trying to remember what this related to. Um, yeah, the words all, that, it's, that's dangerous. Um, maybe there's some 
ameliorating language that we can put in. Where is it again? 51. 51, Pam? I'm, uh, you know what happened, Chris? I stopped sharing my screen, so I'm trying to find it. Hold on. Am I back on there the right? We see it. Yeah. Yep, we see it. All snow plowed within the project shall be promptly removed from the site as part of the clearing process. Um, to the extent possible. Is there some wording we can put in there that? I think if you got rid of all and put to the extent possible, I think that would be fine. Okay, how about that? Okay. okay um... Any other comments on the on the boilerplate section of this? Again, we have a copy of this that you emailed. You know, this part I don't think has changed. So, no. Nope. Um, okay, so we want to go through um, conditions for fifteen East Pleasant, which are shorter. Right. Mm -hmm. You want me to read those? Uh, Take turn. Okay, yeah, I want you to start. We'll start, okay. So this is for 15 East Pleasant for the um, accessory use. Um, con number one, construction staging and access plan for 15 East Pleasant shall be built and used substantially in accordance with the plan submitted to the planning board as follows. A construction management plan prepared by SVE Associates dated March 17th, 2021. B site plan prepared by SVE Associates dated April 7th, 2021 and approved on whenever you approve it. Number two, construction staging and access plan shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted to the planning board and approved on whatever date you approve it. Upon a change of ownership or if the property is no longer managed by Archipelago Investments, the new owner and or manage, manager shall, shall submit a new management plan to the planning board at a public meeting for its review and approval. The purpose of the meeting shall be for the board to determine whether conditions of the permit are being complied with and whether any modification to the site plan review approval or management plan is required. Number five, changes to the project and or substantial changes to any approved site plans shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of the submittal will be for the planning board to approve the change and or to determine whether the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require modification of the special permit or site plan review. In this case, it's just site plan review. Sorry for leaving in that extra word. Okay. Number six, this site plan review approval shall expire within two years of the date that it is filed with the town clerk unless it has been both recorded at the Registry of Deeds and substantial construction or use has commenced within the two-year time period. Does uh, Kyle want to move change that to 30 months like the? Oh, this just means that he has to file his permit with the Registry of Deeds and start construction within that two-year period. And if he can't do that, he can come back to you to ask for an extension. I'm okay. fine with that. Uh, right. The only comment is on five, the same language of, to changes as previous. What did we say? S substantial changes? Yeah. OK. Um, number seven, within 60 days of the issuance of the certificate of occupancy for 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street, the Temporary construction staging use shall cease. Um, the site shall be cleaned of debris, grades leveled, bituminous concrete surface and fencing installed as per plan submitted and approved. Number eight, upon completion in accordance with the final landscape and site improvements plan for 15 East Pleasant, the site at 15 East Pleasant shall not be used for parking or any other use prior to the applicant receiving site plan review approval or special permit approval. Site improvements, number nine, the town engineer and building commissioner shall inspect the construction of the entry driveway and all on-site paved areas for conformance to town standards. Number 10, all on-site utilities shall be underground. Number 11, 
All exterior lighting shall be dark sky compliant. Exterior lighting shall be downcast, shielded, and shall not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. Um, number 12, completion of work. Number 12, the applicant shall provide as built plans that show pavement and fencing location, grades, access ways, um, sidewalks, walkways, curbing, applicable stormwater management, lighting utilities to the building commissioner, town engineer, and to be placed within the site plan review files. So these are um, from here on until 16 is kind of boilerplate. So then we'll skip to 17. And yeah. 17 is the same uh, wording that um, Kyle wanted to have changed. So this 17, instead of saying all snow plowed, it would say snow plowed within the project area shall be promptly removed from the site as part of the clearing process to the extent, what did we say, to the extent feasible. Well, and I would, I would even ask about that. I mean, this is, I, I'd like to obviously have some, a snow bank there. I don't want to remove it. I think if we have to plow it, um, I wouldn't want to have to pick that up and take it off of this site. It's different than the site next door. So this is a staging site. So yeah, the board I don't want to have that, to. That snow can be remain in place on the staging site. And just so everybody knows, snow is very difficult to move around. There's a lot of re regulations about moving snow off sites. So it's not an easy thing to do. So does it make sense to strike this number 17 for this particular site? That's what I'd ask for, please. And you're the one who has to move uh, on that site. Johanna and Doug. I'd be comfortable with that for the site. Okay, and Doug? So would I. Okay. Should be fine. Okay. Um, number 18, all trash pickup deliveries and operation of construction maintenance machinery and landscaping. Um, this is another thing that's all about construction. So I don't think we need to... No, number 19 is the project shall comply with and be managed in accordance with all terms of the management plan. Any alterations to this plan shall be approved by the planning board at a public meeting. If the property or business operations are sold, the new owner shall meet with the planning board at a public meeting to review the management plan and to determine if it is still applicable and to decide whether or not to hold a public hearing to review and approve the new management plan. Number 20, a demolition permit shall be issued prior to any demolition on the property taking place. And then the other conditions are all having to do with construction. So we've gotten through the findings and the conditions for the two site plan review applications and the two special permit applications. Um, we still have a, um, a site plan review application hanging out there that um, hasn't been acted on, um, but perhaps uh, the applicant will request withdrawal of that um, after the board votes on the other items. So okay. um, what you would wanna do now is take each item individually and close the public hearing and um, then vote as to whether you're going to approve the application with waivers and conditions and findings as listed or as reviewed. Okay. Um, Doug? I was going to make a motion to that effect. Um, moved that we close the public hearings and accept the findings and conditions for the 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street and 15 East Pleasant Street as we've reviewed and discussed this evening with the edits that uh, were discussed. Okay, and that's uh, and that's the, 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 that's SPP twenty twenty one oh three, and then SPR twenty twenty one oh nine, which is fifteen East Pleasant Street, and and then SPR twenty twenty one twelve, which is eleven and thirteen East Pleasant Street. Are people comfortable doing that this way or would they prefer to do perhaps the site plan review reviews first and then do the special permits separately? Um, because if, if you do it this way, then you're sort of asking people to vote up or down on everything. Right, let's, let's do the site plan review first, I guess. So, 
So do you want to change? Does Doug so want I'll, to I'll withdraw my motion and let somebody else make the motion in a way that's more acceptable to you guys. I think it would be exactly the same way that you said it, except to just list the two special permit or the two site plan reviews. Yeah. Just want to amend, amend that, Doug? Sure. Okay. Uh, we got a second, Maria. Second. Okay. So any further discussion and um, I see none. So we can do uh, a roll call, I guess. So Maria. Can we, I'm sorry, can we clarify, are we voting on the SPR, okay, for 15 East Pleasant Street or 11 East Pleasant? Are we gonna do those separately or? I think we were, com we're combining those two, both of them. Oh. So the, uh, you know, the 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street is uh, SPR 2021-12 and then the 15 East Pleasant Street is SPR 2021-09. And we're voting to close the hearing, right? For those okay. two site plan review, okay. I just, bubbling I, those together. A little confused. Okay. So uh, with regard to closing the hearings for those two site plan review hearings, uh, Maria? I think um, made the um, motion initially said they wanted to accept everything, not just close the public hearings, but to accept things. So is that what you're voting on? I don't know. Doug's initial motion was I, to close right. the public hearings, accept the findings and conditions. And then uh, I, I believe he was saying to approve this, um, all of the permits for okay. I, I mean, suggested, and I stepped back and said, it, don't do that because I'm not sure that everybody's going to vote in favor of everything. I, I would guess that you would probably get a positive vote for the site plan reviews. And so I suggested that you close the public hearing, accept the conditions and findings for the two site plan reviews and, and approve those two applications. And, and you are correct. That, I think that's, that is what, that's what was amended. And um, so sorry about that. Sorry for the confusion. So everybody clear on, on what we're voting on here? I think, I think what you just said, Chris has nailed it. So, all right, uh, Maria. Oh, yeah, Johanna. Yeah, Maria. Okay. Sorry, I, I am not totally clear. Are we, Why is this we... for the whole enchilada or is this just to close the hearings? And it's then a whole enchilada. To the whole enchilada. Great. Yeah. Well, no, it's not the whole... no, it's not. Let's, okay. do it one, let's do it one at a time. Yeah. How about if I make a motion and then somebody else says, I move that? How does that work? Is that good? Okay. okay, so um, this is putting words in somebody's mouth, but this is about um, 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street, um, SPR 2021-12 for 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street. This, this is a site plan review to close the public hearing to um, approve the application with the findings and conditions as written and the waivers as written, as, as amended. Okay, so moved. You have a second? Second. All right, second. I'm sorry, I, I did not see who did the first. Who? I moved it. Jack, you, Jack moved. And then Mr. Marshall, Doug. too. Yeah. Okay. okay, so this is on the 11 and, and 13 uh, site plan review. Uh, any discussion? Okay, let's go to vote. Oh, Andrew. Yeah, I just want to make sure as I still need to abstain from this, Chris, since we're combining the closing with uh, um, the approval. Yes. Oh, yes. W which is fine. I am just and and even though we did like the site plan review, like the 
we discussed these in their entirety today. I still can't vote on them. Okay. Unfortunately, yeah. Okay. That, thank you for clarifying. All righty. So um, let's move the vote. Maria? Approve. And, um, Andrew, you're abstaining, correct? Yes. All right. And uh, Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. Janet? No. Um, Johanna? Aye. And I'm an I as well. So it's 5 1. Great. So. Okay. So the next one would be the um, site plan review for 15 East Pleasant Street, which would be to close the public hearing for SPR 2021 09 for 15 East Pleasant Street. And this is for the accessory use of that property. And you're closing the public hearing. You're um, accepting the findings and conditions as um, discussed and as amended, and the waivers as requested, and approving this um, site plan review application. Very good. Um, that was Tom? Yeah. OK. Um, someone want a second? Second. McKenna, it's Doug. Uh, any further discussion? See none. Okay, roll call. Maria? Approve. Andrew? Abstaining. Okay. Uh, Doug? Approve. Tom? Approve. Janet? Is, is this for 15 East Pleasant or a Correct. Oh, Correct. Okay. Yes, it's fine. Okay. Uh, Johanna? Approve. And myself is uh, an aye. So that's six with one abstention. Yes. Okay. Uh, next one is um, special permit for um, site for setbacks, site setback on the north side of the building and the height. So that would be the special permit SPP 2021-02. So then you're closing the public hearing. You're um, approving this special permit for um, a five foot setback on the north side of the building and for the height of 57 feet. And you're approving the findings and conditions and waivers and um, approving this special permit application. Is the rear setback included in that? No. Okay. It's written here on the agenda because it was initially asked for that way, but um, we discovered that he needed another special permit under 9.22 to accommodate the, the rear, um, the rear uh, setback, okay? So, you understand? Initially, he applied for a special permit for site setback, height, and rear setback. But we determined, Rob Mara and I, afterwards, that he needed an, a different kind of special permit for the rear setback. So you're not, a, you're not approving that part of this under this item. So we would exclude the rear setback from this um, vote. Rear setback's the next item. That's right. So, oh, that's 2021-02? That's Twenty twenty one dash oh two is what we're voting on now, right? Um, but you're excluding the rear setback. Okay. Because the rear setback is taken care of under a different special permit application. That's the which first is, one on the agenda. Which is oh three. It's oh three. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So yes. All right. For oh two, you're just approving the side setback of five feet and the height of fifty seven feet. I'll move. Okay. Uh, I'll second. Any discussion? I see none. So we'll do a, a roll call for for this. Uh, Maria. Approve. 
And Andrew? Um, Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. Janet? No. Uh, Johanna? Aye. And I am an I as well. Okay, so you have one more, and this is special permit SPP 202103, um, and it is a special permit for a nonconforming building to be structurally altered, enlarged, or reconstructed under section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw for a mixed use building. And you are um, closing the public hearing and you are approving the findings and conditions and approving the special permit. Anyone? So moved. So moved. Okay, Tom. Tom moved. And who seconded? Maria. I'll second. This is Maria. All right, Maria, second. Okay, any discussion amongst the board? I see none. We'll do roll call. Um, Maria. Approve. And Andrew Stain. Okay, Doug. Aye. Tom. Aye. Janet. No. Uh, Johanna? Aye. And I am an I. So. I think that's it. Okay. That's Is it. Kyle with us? Does he want to take care of that one? Please. I'd like okay. to, uh, I'd like to use whatever language I need to use to withdraw without prejudice. So I guess it's, I'd like to request to withdraw without prejudice. Please. And that would be um, the application that is listed as SPR 2021-07. Okay. And to close the public hearing. All right. Uh, no, do we have to close the public hearing? Uh, might as well. So, so someone should move to close the public hearing and approve the withdrawal without prejudice. So move. Okay. Tom um, moved. Second. And. Doug, second. Any discussion? I see none. Uh, Maria? Approve. And Andrew? Aye. Aye. I, I can vote for this one, right? Oh, good. Yeah. Yes. I okay. think you can vote for this one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. Janet? Um, aye. And Johanna? Aye. And I'm an aye. Thank you. So, all right. So, I think we um, we're meeting we next. Yeah. yeah, I think we just go to the end of the agenda because we're meeting next week, right? So, that's right. Um, yeah. Report of the chair, none. Report of staff. Just meeting next week, Thank right? Thank you. A lot of hard work. Okay. I'd like to thank everybody. I all appreciate right. it. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. For all the time. Good night. Thanks Maria. for coming. Yeah. Hey, Maria. All the way. <laughs> I hope I hope I broke our world record. <laughs> <laughs> Traveling the greatest. I can't is believe five. it. <laughs> it's 5 wow. a.m. here. <laughs> 5 a.m. All right. Uh, I'll let wow. Yeah, I've done all nighters in design school, so this is us normal. But um, let me know if you need me next week, but hopefully not. But if you do, I can call in late. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Good Bye. night, everyone.